we start? Yes, please go ahead. So, uh, so we're starting. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it feels great uh, to be connected through Zoom. And uh, we are glad uh, to host this tutorial on knowledge infused deep learning. And uh, uh, for a, a question and answering, uh, actually, we actually the way we have set up is that all the questions from the audience uh, will be taken during a short break after the first two presentations. And after the uh, there will be a long break for like 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the tutorial so that you can have a kind of a breakout one to one session with all the presenters to actually an idea of uh, like do you have very specific questions to ask for them. So please use the question answering. Uh, maybe there's a icon at the bottom of Zoom uh, to ask you or post your questions. So let's get started uh, with a broad vision of the tutorial. I do not see question answer uh, button. Usually there is that. I see chat button. Uh, is maybe this somebody... isn't the webinar format. It's just a regular Zoom call. So we'll have to use chat. OK. All right. So guys, use chat. OK. So uh, the, uh, the thesis for the tutorial would be uh, the first, the broad vision of the, uh, of the tutorial is how do you make a, a system more intelligent? So when I say system, the first thing that pops up to our mind is more of like a virtual assistant. So we say that there's a, a question answer. Let's, let me go back to be very specific. So uh, consider a very simple scenario of a, a virtual assistant, which you often see on call centers and every other app. It's more like ask you, so you ask a simple questions and yet you get a response. So this is more like a conversations and a simple question answering uh, toolbox. What one, one expect is that suppose you have uh, more specific questions and you want a more specific answer to it, then you definitely require the chatbot or the virtual assistant to have some kind of a background information. So you here you actually talk about, let's say I just add or augment a domain knowledge to the chatbot for a better functioning. And what we expect from as a vision from this tutorial, that would be a kind of a takeaway would be how we can actually have a better version of uh, and a system which can actually take open questions, can have affirmations, be more reflective to the question being asked by the user or by the, uh, the person who is using the system and should be able to generate summaries so that it can actually be come in handy for the next conversation so that every conversation is still within the context. Considering this uh, scenario, uh, let's say uh, what we want to do is we want to gain a deeper understanding of the content. So this is the overall uh, idea that we want to, we want the system to gain a better understanding of the content. So suppose you have uh, millions of uh, social media data that you have, you have already you crawled from Twitter. You take a state of the art deep learning or neural parsing approach, which is basically uh, known to have being able to capture uh, entities or more, uh, sp uh, more specifically concept, which makes sense to the end user and you come up with a clustering approach and you show a visualization where you see multiple topics being discussed in one particular cluster. This forms a, a concept known as shallow semantics because still we know that these people are talking about some concepts, but how do we make sense of these concepts? So we actually move a step forward to actually utilize the knowledge graph to actually get an understanding of these concepts. And how do we do that is basically like we kind of uh, shade this, we get a shaded version of it because of the knowledge graph. And what we essentially do is we see that the nervousness, agita agitation on all those topics are basically linked to a common term known as anxiety, which can be described. And so all the cohorts, all the users within that cluster can be represented being talking about this thing. So this is basically a, a step towards gaining a better understanding of the content, which we term as a deeper semantics. A very interesting insight that you can gather from this knowledge graph would be the gathering uh, understanding of the context, as well as checking that, that an interesting point that the sleep disorder and the circadian rhythm disorder was actually are the same. So they are, they are basically same in terms of an abstract sense. So this was an illustration that we did as a part of the COVID-19 analysis of the social media. So the uh, use of computing, so use of knowledge graph in computing has been from since 2000 and it's pretty, uh, pretty much been triggered by the less amount of data that we have 
uh, is more uh, uh, conscious towards the ambiguity. So there is an ambiguity in the data and you don't want to resolve it. And uh, the other issues are basically more towards like false alarms and reducing the false negatives at large. So as there has been studies in the past, which talks about that data alone is not enough because data alone has uh, many incompleteness. They have, they do, are, they do not have sufficient information to actually give a right information. So you actually require some kind of background knowledge to help machine learning uh, or deep learning model to understand the context in a much better way. So this actually, these, these questions actually forms a concrete uh, takeaways for this tutorial. The first part is we will be actually talking about in our examples and through uh, theoretical uh, guarantees that interpretability and traceability are actually the key complement, uh, components for explainability in a machine learning or deep learning paradigm. We want to be, we will be talking about some of the ethics, biases, and false alarms, which can be resolved by the use of knowledge graph. And how we can actually get a deeper understanding of the content use, including context understanding in a one, one particular, in some particular domains where you actually need the context so that the system can be generalized to a different domains. And in all this together, the major question is what is the right knowledge graph to use? So is this is actually the uh, is a ma major question because you cannot always use a general knowledge graph to solve all social good related problems. So uh, this actually uh, forms up as kind of a bucket where you have unstructured and structured data, you have models and these all encapsulated in the knowledge graph and you can able to compute them. And this form forms an application workflow for the knowledge infused deep learning. So about the tutorial, uh, the first presentation would be uh, about the, all about the knowledge graph, getting an intricacies of the knowledge graph. What are the different knowledge graphs are there or how they have been constructed, how they have been used in different pipelines and what are the major questions that have been raised around the knowledge graphs. Then we will be talking about the knowledge infused deep learning, which is the core uh, component of the tutorial as well. And we will be um, uh, appreciating this concept with different applications, one specific to cyber social threat, other would be autonomous driving. And then we will be talking about the dark net, which is also, also an unexplored territory within the web. Uh, so we on to the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Sheth will be taking care of the, uh, we'll be talking about all about the knowledge graphs. Okay, let's hope that uh, uh, my slide loads faster than last time. There is some reason, okay, there you are. I hope you're able to see my slides. So yes. this is a this is a um, uh, hype chart that Gartner puts about, um, and this is what this one is from uh, eighteen months to twenty four months earlier. Uh, this is a time when uh, I was visiting uh, University of jo uh, uh, South Carolina, uh, where uh, I was you know uh, contemplating to move to start this uh, AI institute. We have a university wide AI institute. And you will see here uh, in this graph, uh, the knowledge graph put up here on the left hand side and it's ascending. And if you see more recent um, version of this, you'll see that knowledge graph has substantially ascended. You'll see in this particular, see, you see that deep learning is at the pinnacle, meaning that it's at the, high, you know, at the top of the hype cycle. And then uh, I guess the tension would be going down. Uh, this has come out to be remarkably um, accurate, at least as I saw that. And um, in um, uh, and, and, and uh, the importance of knowledge graphs have continued to increase. What I want to do is to share with you uh, how the knowledge graphs have come about, the status of the knowledge graph, and um, uh, how they are helping uh, with the entire AI ecosystem, especially in the learning algorithms. So knowledge graph is a structured knowledge in a graph representation, in many cases, labeled property graph or RDA for its variants. Um, and um, in some sense, it is a, um, 
uh, compromise in the continuum between expressivity and computability. So it's not the most of the expressive form of knowledge representation. Um, but the most important thing is that um, as in RDF, a, almost all knowledge graphs should have relationship as a very key element, just as uh, entities are, relations should be, should be first class object. I've been saying that for a couple of decades that relationship is at the heart of semantics. Semantics meaning, uh, meaning associating meaning with the data. Now there are multiple, uh, there are variety of uh, related forms. Uh, the most uh, well-known uh, term is ontology. Um, and uh, it comes, um, uh, typically it is knowledge graph, uh, sort of knowledge representation, uh, but it, uh, it, it implies ontological commitment, meaning commitment by the people who use it, by the people who develop it. Typically it comes in a richer knowledge representative format. Um, there are other, uh, you know, forms, knowledge base, lexicon, and knowledge network where uh, there is a network of um, knowledge representation, uh, representative knowledge uh, that serves a larger community. It could serve one domain or multiple domain. Uh, this is an, a very old slide in a way. Uh, it shows you uh, knowledge representation uh, and expressiveness range from the left hand side where it is uh, weakly expressive, not very expressive to the right hand side where it is more expressive. Um, it takes more effort to document something on, on using a rich knowledge representative format um, and it takes less effort if you are on the left hand side. Um, there is a time it takes to uh, get the thing started, to get applications developed using uh, this knowledge representation. Um, and uh, generally what we have found is that um, the cost of developing rich knowledge representation is way too high. Uh, the automation is much harder. Uh, the ability to collect the facts and reuse them is much, much more difficult. Hence somewhere in the middle, uh, there is a better compromise where there is adequate expressiveness and yet uh, it also uh, scales much better. Um, these are some of the ontology examples um, over the, you know, over many years. Most of these, as you see here, are developed by human hands, by humans. Uh, they don't, uh, they may be developed by a single person, multiple person, a community, a group, and so on and so forth. But you can see the variety here. There is something, uh, uh, you know, called common sense reasoning graph. There's something called uh, event ontology uh, for any kind of event. There's something for uh, crisis ontology, very specific to the crisis and other thing uh, called drug abuse ontology. My group has developed. Uh, so the eventology, the drug ontology, crisis ontology, these are the things that are developed in my group. And um, you can see they come with the different representation, different richness and such. Now, um, you know, a very much more scaled attempt uh, to develop a knowledge graph uh, kind of dates back in around year 1999, 2000. In 1999, I formed a company uh, and uh, this was the pattern that was filed in year 2000 and awarded in 2001. And we had commercial semantic search engine uh, in those days uh, that was purely that, that used extensively uh, both machine learning and knowledge graph. In the right hand side, you can actually see a knowledge graph. Incidentally, um, you know, the use of these terms ontology, knowledge graph and search have been, um, uh, you know, in flux and, and been used um, uh, interchangeably. So in the pattern itself, uh, I had used the term ontology and world model. Uh, I, uh, during the AAAI this year, I heard uh, one of the three uh, Turing uh, Award winner use the word world model. So it's also very interesting that these terms have found different uh, usages over the period of time. What has happened is that in the last couple of decades, uh, there's been proliferation of uh, broad-based and domain-specific use of knowledge graph. So on the left hand side, you see a bunch of uh, broad based knowledge graph. Many of them are community developed. So uh, DBpedia is derived from Wikipedia. In that sense, it is a community developed uh, knowledge graph. Um, uh, Freebase was developed um, manually, uh, largely manually by a gr small group of people. Uh, and, and Wikidata is also a group activity and such. Um, knowledge Vault, which is no, uh, no longer being developed or used, um, uh, was an attempt to do a lot more automation. Uh, NEL is an attempt to, is, is something that has more auto, auto automation, but quality is suspect. On the right hand side, you can see just in one domain, the domain of health um, 
healthcare, a variety of knowledge graph. Interestingly, most of these are community effort. Uh, most of them have involved a uh, uh, decent size of um, uh, people coming together, uh, a group of the, in, in, incorporating uh, experts from the domain to develop these knowledge graphs. Uh, although drug abuse ontology was developed with much smaller number of people. Um, now, these are, you know, uh, some very large kind of sources of knowledge and uh, they also themselves become source for extracting the knowledge for a particular purpose. So link data, schema.org, wikidata, they cover pretty broad areas. And uh, then as needed, you could write, um, you know, you could, you could use tools and techniques to find relevant uh, components from that. So in this particular example, linked open data, which is the largest source of possibly structured knowledge on the web, um, you can write filtering on that uh, to look for book related information. There are a variety of efforts to create um, book related information. Here you see DBTORP, DBpedia, uh, uh, containing certain parts of books and other things and Project Gutenberg, all of them having uh, uh, information about books. And from there on, you can create just the book specific um, thing, removing the rest of the information. So there is a, you know, there's the ability to get started with existing knowledge and getting just what you need for your application. Um, uh, now in the last few years though, particularly this decade, um, and in fact, I would say uh, after 2012, when uh, the world knowledge graph actually became far more popular, uh, uh, it was 2012 when Google came out with the semantic search and it showed that basically uh, a knowledge graph has indispensable role, at least in the semantic search. And then people saw that uh, the a knowledge graph has indispensable role in many of the enterprise application that these different companies are working on. So you can see Facebook, LinkedIn, Airbnb, all of them having their own large knowledge graphs. Uh, in many cases, hundreds of thousands of people work in managing and maintaining those knowledge graphs. Uh, it is interesting when I look back at the year 2000 when we had developed a bunch of tools to develop pretty significant size knowledge graph from existing source, mining existing sources, and the level of automation we had, I haven't seen a, a large um, growth in uh, and substantial growth in being able to create knowledge graphs automatically. Interestingly, many small companies have uh, built knowledge graph and uh, some of the small companies, basically, their whole uh, value uh, system is all uh, centered around the use of knowledge graph. One of the companies I co-founded uh, called EZDI uh, is extensive where the knowledge graph is the center of everything we do, including all the deep learning and machine learning we do in that company. There are also uh, companies like MANA that develop um, knowledge graph for individual companies. So the services are available. Uh, on the right hand side, I've taken material from a paper where it talks about industry scale knowledge graph, what, they, what do they model in the knowledge graph, what model data model they have used, representation model they have used, uh, and development stage and the size of the uh, uh, graph. And you can see that some of them are pretty large. Now, um, uh, in this tutorial, we are really focusing on how um, knowledge graph plays, uh, can play and will play in future very significant role in improving uh, or handling the shortcomings of deep learning. So in a very simple case, uh, when you want to, in here we are presenting uh, um, some examples from question answering. Uh, if you have text that you just see uh, there and a question, in this case, uh, a deep learning algorithm would typically answer correctly, the answer would be yes. But in some other case, uh, in the middle case you see here, uh, there's a text there and uh, it's a little bit convoluted test, a little bit complex text. And um, uh, the question is, does the person suffer from depression? Uh, the, uh, tradition, the, the majority of the state of the art deep learning algorithm will answer yes, although the correct answer is no. And here, uh, having a context, for example, is very important. Uh, in this case, COVID context. And then uh, there's, there's mention of pandemic, as you can see on that text. Uh, and then there are a bunch of questions here uh, in the in the bottom, are you feeling nervous or anxious or on the edge? And questions along that line. 
and you can see that um, there are some uh, you know techniques uh, that are trying to answer these kind of questions but generally answering these kind of things is pretty hard for existing systems so uh, uh, currently most of the deep learning approaches state of deep learning approaches are not integrated with prior knowledge or knowledge of the domain and uh, uh, this uh, tutorial is about the strategies of being able to do so and the benefits of uh, doing so the reasons for doing so there is a um, we, we are going to be covering a, a number of shortcomings of deep learning uh, as we go along earlier manas presented that you know uh, key uh, of the uh, objectives people have in deep learning explanation and uh, ethical issues and so on and so forth here i am taking one very specific issue that of the uh, representation of relationship uh, clearly shelter in place causes anxiety and shelter in place prevents anxiety are entirely different things employee owning a stack in the stock in a company and employee uh, working for the company are entirely different thing these are different relationship tying with the same uh, pairs of relation, uh, entities today if you see uh, you know uh, a general uh, deep learning algorithm such as uh, graph cnn uh, gra uh, graph convolutional neural network uh they would not be able to identify or they, they their internal representation actually doesn't would not distinguish between these two types of relationship the same was true if you go back to uh, earlier uh, you know techniques like latent semantic indexing or latent semantics and uh, you know algo related algorithms but uh, if you use a knowledge graph that uh, separately models the relationships causes and prevents then you can develop a solution to be able to do so so there are a um, um, number of natural language processing and nlu questions uh, here are some that i have listed how do you learn quickly from small amount of data how do you mine a relationship from existing uh, text how do you reliably classify entities into a known ontology um contextualize the words understanding of uh, you know natural language um query interpretation understanding uh, qu actual user question uh, especially in open world context answering questions with trust and transparency uh, and things like reasonability or meaningfulness of the response to a questions these are some of the things which currently uh, deep learning based um, nlp nlu techniques uh, face uh, challenges they face and uh, knowledge graph um, you know creates um, provides you better handle and tools to be able to address those problems um is this image on the left hand side is from talukdar um and uh, today if you ask the same question to different um uh, you know chatbots uh, you'll get diff you could get on some of the questions different answers because they they have different um knowledge graphs or they are not using knowledge graph or they are not yet, not yet enough enough of the knowledge graph exists for them or they are still relying too much on machine learning and not knowledge graph and they're trained on different corpus so all of those uh, can lead to different answers well uh, many things are based on the fact they should have a, the same answer and in that case using knowledge graph would be very important using a trusted knowledge graph uh, earlier the you know manas gave an example of the role, you know use of knowledge graph for contextualization here is a, a complementary example for personalization here a patient has been communicating with a chatbot and um you know uh, the uh, personalization come can take different form it can take the form of um uh the um uh, prior communications or questions that a patient has asked and you are given the answer to or it may take the uh, form that you actually understand that the, this particular user the answer you and you give answer that is pertinent to this user so in this particular case it so happens on the right hand side you see uh, that the system understands um, uh, that this patient has asthma and that the uh, it also even understands that um, a patient has um, asthma and one of the uh, reason uh, that patient gets asthma is because of pollen particularly ragweed pollen and uh, this is stored in what we call as personalized health knowledge graph something that we talked about uh, a few years ago and that because uh, this personalized health knowledge graph intervenes the uh, question answering uh, it is able to pick the right answer and or add or enhance the answer uh, or uh, uh, come up with a, 
interaction that is a lot more human like more pertinent uh, personalized for the user without knowledge graph without uh, any uh, structure represent of knowledge about the patient you can't do that so it's a very powerful example of why you need to have knowledge graph here um this is a company this is a knowledge graph from ezdi uh, for disclosure i am a co-founder of this company and um and and and, and uh, directed in a way uh, development of this knowledge graph so there's a very comprehensive knowledge graph uh, that uh, the company has developed um and uh, is discussed in um is used for natural language processing discussed in this patent uh, awarded um and uh, essentially um using the knowledge graph uh we are able to uh, analyze a broad variety of data unstructured structured data you can see on the left and the platform uh, called easy nlp platform has a, uh, a whole bunch of uh, capabilities nl natural language processing clinical knowledge graph machine learning and it uh, is able to extract entities of different kinds that are relevant to clinical uh, text processing so uh, you know when you have um, um, electronic medical record you have variety of things like problems uh, procedure medical de uh, uh, device personalized health information analytical structure these are all different aspects of the medical knowledge or healthcare related knowledge and the system is able to uh, you know uh, better understand each of the types of you know entities uh, and the, do better because it has a deep domain knowledge about um, each of them here is an example where we use um, uh, uh, you know a, a representative of a knowledge that was extracted from dpvdia and on the left hand side there is a little bit of discuss, you know um, uh, left side of the pipeline shows you creation of the enriched lexicon to gather abstract meaning for gender based violence on the right hand side you can see that there is an application of that uh, thing in recently we analyzed 800 million tweets uh to understand uh, mental health addiction and uh, gender based violence and uh the understanding of knowledge on the left hand side was used in the understanding of the tweets on right hand side and then develop um uh later on a, a gender based violence based estimation which is shown in the bottom of the graph and there is a video uh, uh that uh, you can look at it uh, at your leisure uh, that discusses how the knowledge uh, graph was used in analyzing very large corpus of uh, twitter data or news corpus uh, to to understand get deep deep understanding in this case uh, about covid-19 related content all uh, right uh, the next uh, one uh, i'm going to skip in the interest of time um here i want to show one very interesting um uh, uh, example a particularly relevant example uh you might have sensed the trend that um, after a lot of attention uh, to just text alone or to just image alone uh, you know in the past in the you know decade earlier we used to focus on a stove pipe situation so you only dealt with text you only dealt with images but what has happened is that um, you know people have come to realize that a um, lot of information is multimodal in fact right now as you know any human uh, you are consuming speech you are consuming text you are consuming video all of these senses are supporting your comprehensive understanding of what is being um, exchanged here between me and you so the same thing is true uh, in this case during disaster uh, you can have uh, sensory data like those uh, sensors on the road that can tell you about how many vehicles are going per seconds on the or per minute from that particular road uh, link or there may be uh, social media data and this example shows you that it is a uh, use of knowledge base uh, makes it easier to understand very complex entities uh, for example one of the entity here we analyze was uh, half moon bay brewing company now this 5 gram or 6 gram is incredibly hard if you were to use standard uh, information extraction algorithm and your best deep learning algorithm would have very hard time understanding this kind of uh, you know complex and compound entities uh, while it is much easier if you do have the knowledge of the domain for example we had open street map and that had uh, lo locations and entities one of the entity was half moon bay brewing company that makes it easier to understand that that is an entity in the text but beyond that what happened here is that because of the use of knowledge graph 
is possible that you can map uh, uh, sensory data onto the knowledge graph as well as map social media or textual data onto the knowledge graph and, the, and link them together. My own hypothesis is based on study of cognitive science that uh, we humans uh, also have our knowledge and experiences and we use our knowledge and experience to uh, understand uh, all kinds of signals that come to our brain. And uh, the use of knowledge also makes it easier to connect different forms of data, different modality of data uh, to come together. So uh, you might have seen that most of the deep learning techniques are still uh, focusing on single mod modality. To make these techniques more multimodal, uh, again, the domain model will play a very important role. Uh, here is an example of um, uh, a system that we built uh, for prescription drug abuse. Uh, and this is an ontology or a fragment of the ontology for drug abuse. And it was used to understand uh, um, uh, the content, a very complex content, very difficult content in many different ways. So you look at the content here, you see the text here on, on, on something like Reddit. And that's a pretty complex test. And more importantly, in the text, we want to try and understand a lot of different components of natural language, entities, uh, relationships, interval, temp time interval, uh, dosage. Uh, in this particular case, route of administration. Uh, is the drug being snorted? Is the drug, drug being delivered through injection? Uh, is the drug being taken as a pill form, crush pill form? All these are very relevant things and you need to understand them, right? So uh, uh, we use a broad variety of techniques, ontology or knowledge graph-based techniques on the left-hand side. Uh, lexicon-based techniques, uh, the uh, lexico-ontological techniques, and rule-based gravel techniques. There's no one size fit all. So variety of techniques were used uh, to understand different types of uh, information to be extracted. And um, you know there are very interesting things to learn here for us uh, that show the power of knowledge graph. I'll just give you one example. You see on the uh, right-hand image on the top, you see buprenorphine in the corpus. We measured that for every one occurrence of buprenorphine, there were 29 occurrences of related terms that mean the same. So subutex and suboxone are the brand names of buprenorphine, and bup and bup are the street names of, on slangs of buprenorphine. Right? All of them they mean the same. You know, mean the same thing. Now uh, I can I can I can challenge anybody to uh, have high recall, uh, considering all these 29 different variants of the same term. Uh, without use of knowledge graph. It was the use of knowledge graph that um, um, really made this possible in connection with uh, you know, machine learning techniques or NLP techniques. Here you can see, of course, a variety of all of them used. Uh, this study was, by the way, very interesting for us, a um, matter of big pride, uh, and because this paper uh, that we published in 2000 became a seminal paper in the field of drug abuse. Uh, three toxicology studied followed by, uh, followed by our study uh, citing our work. And in 2016, FDA came out with the warning of the misuse of lopramide, Imodium AD, by people who were abusing uh, prescription drugs. So it's very interesting how epidemiological and public health work uh, can be benefited by scientific work that we do. I'm going to pass that. There is extensive work that is going on. Uh, here, there is a, uh, a company called Mbibe, and in full disclosure, I'm a consultant of the company where it is being used for personalized learning, education, and the knowledge graph again plays a very central role in this process. In another application we are developing, uh, again, knowledge graph, the same idea I talked about in personalized knowledge graph helps capture the current understanding of the student and the evolution and learning of the students over the period of time so that the students can be provided pers uh, personalized and customized uh, 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 you know, uh, reading material and text and educational test uh, based on, you know, where the knowledge graph plays a very important role. And, um, okay. All right, uh, let us. Here, um, I, I deal with uh, a situation very quickly. Uh, we worked on something called um, uh, implicit entities. And um, uh, you want to figure out that um, accumulation of fluid in its extremities is edema. 
and um, understanding uh, this kind of thing is extremely difficult and deep learning would have a hard time or machine learning would have a hard time because uh, there are too many variations and very few incidents of each variations right so there's not just enough of the uh, proof the number of uh, you know uh, uh, cases you can learn from is very limited yes there are evolving deep learning techniques uh, uh, to learn from very few examples um, again i think use of knowledge graph makes it easier to learn the other important thing is that uh, in the corpus we studied between 20 and 40% of all the entities were actually uh, implicit entities and interestingly most of the literature just ignores this implicit entity they only work on uh, uh, computing explicit entities uh, there's another interesting thing that uh, uh, you know is worth noting that by and large we talk about the factual knowledge but there is also this abstract knowledge and uh, for example cognitive scientists and um, uh people who are uh, developing new instructional methodology have figured out the uh, uh significant role of analogy in learning how how children learn how how students learn uh and um uh, how do we uh, support learning through such abstract uh, you know knowledge uh, such as an analogical generalization is a very interesting uh a uh, challenge uh, and in the bottom you see for example that um, there is a uh, concept frame coming from um, the uh, you know that in all concepts of uh, sun mass and planets uh, and physics that is being applied uh, to a different uh, sort of um, uh, uh, area uh, so you are learning analogy from the left hand side to the right hand side similarly uh, there is another example uh, one of my uh, friends uh, or, or you know uh, that i know very well has created a very large analogical knowledge base and uh, there is this real uh, analogy that some students gave to explain the um, uh, enzyme kinetics um, um, uh, you know uh, uh, process he the student used musical chairs example to um, uh, an, uh, to to as an analogy and um, a uh, use of uh, we are developing techniques that use knowledge graph to uh, kind of um help create a more accurate analogies now um, this is a pipeline um, amazon for example uses uh, you know this kind of pipeline and uh, you can see the the point i want to make here is that machine learning deep learning and knowledge graph are increasingly interleaving that um, you use machine learning or deep learning for knowledge extraction uh you use them for improving knowledge alignment um you use uh, then uh, you know and and for cleaning and then you use knowledge for improving deep learning and you know mining data mining or graph mining embedding and then uh, you know kind of question answering or search or other kind of applications so uh, in, in, in there's a bunch of applic you know um um examples that i've given here mostly from uh, prior work in my team where um, uh, you see that these are all interleaving one thing af helps another one um, and that's kind of important i'll come back to this later on there are many more other applications that we already know of uh, that use both knowledge graph and deep learning uh, and and they are these are listed here so where are we uh, we are increasingly going from hand crafted methods supervised methods weakly supervised methods distantly supervised learning methods to knowledge infused learning methods which is the subject that we are going to discuss uh, in more detail a few early prop, you know uh, papers are there uh, and i we want to share them with you, uh, you know some summary of those but we will be um, uh, you know uh, answering uh, these other questions uh, what is knowledge infusion uh, what and what is knowledge infused learning what are different types of knowledge infused learning and then we would like to give uh, examples of using knowledge infused learning for a variety of very challenging problems um uh, before though i end my part of this tutorial at least this first segment uh, i want to kind of uh, lay out the broader vision uh, that i share with some other people and i you know uh, felt you know uh, 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 seen the potential for quite some time um there was a paper in 2005 uh uh semantics for the semantic web uh, implicit formal and the powerful where i discuss the complementary next of the statistical learning technique with with the um uh, uh with the with the uh, knowledge uh, intensive techniques 
uh, and symbolic presentation techniques, uh, symbolic AI techniques. Uh, but now what is happening is that we are seeing them as very complementary. So, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we believe, I, you know, we talked about knowledge graph that will play increasing role in developing hybrid neurosymbolic uh, systems or a neurosymbolic system, which is hybrid system. Uh, so, you know, the uh, symbolic system is uh, kind of a top-down uh, system uh, combined with uh, 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 statistical learning uh, systems, which is the bottom-up uh, uh, system or, uh, or bottom kind of system. Uh, and, and generally, um, I, I, I take the cue or, or inspiration from work in cognitive science, that is work on um, uh, deep uh, top brain and bottom brain. Uh, and and uh, how uh, you know they solve uh, you know different prob uh, they are involved in joint problem solving. So with that, I pass on to the, to Manas. Manas. So can you see my screen? Yeah, you're coming up. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, moving on to the next uh, thing, as a, as a, as a, as a consequence of, uh, so we all know about the effectiveness of knowledge graph and how they have been used. In the subsequent part of the literature, uh, in the subsequent part of this uh, presentation, what we will be focusing on is how we can actually use this knowledge graph in solving some of the uh, social good related problems in healthcare and how these knowledge graph have been integrated uh, can be integrated into a uh, deep learning or machine learning paradigm and some somewhere it can be as simple as as use them in an optimization framework but before we actually move on to the next uh, so we actually wanted to know why we wanted to study uh, and why we wanted to go after the knowledge infused deep learning first of all actually I, uh, when on my extensive uh, uh, survey of the web you can actually see that online healthcare communications maybe in reddit twitter or if you can, if you are not aware of so you can actually look at the talk live so talk live actually uses some of our work uh, in i'm tagging some of the users on uh, on mental health related communications so we know that ambiguity is one of the major concern and we have seen that the embedding models have provided some shallow infusion of knowledge and so far deep learning has been very much dependent on the large data set which is not available in all other domains considering like say healthcare or you can actually talk about uh, 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 social harms, or you can talk about like uh, uh, looking at the very specific application of disaster domain. So those are like the areas where you do not have large amount of data, but you want to train an effective generalized deep learning models. You in this process, you want to reduce the biases in the data set, right? Which we will cover in subsequently after my uh, talk. So there will be like an information provenance means when you get an output, you are able to, you should be able to track down to the, uh, to the place where the output has come, has been derived by the deep learning model. You want to actually have an information coverage. And in all this process, you are actually trying to have reduce the time and space complexity of the model architecture, right? So this is still in work in progress. I would say reduce time and space complexity is still working because right now, so if you add knowledge, it's kind of an add on information to your processing of your models. So it's kind of like a turnaround time is pretty uh, um, leaning towards the higher side of it, but it's still an unexplored area on how to reduce time and complexity when you do knowledge infusion. But, uh, but the gains are improving the sensitivity and specificity leading to explainability of your uh, architecture. So uh, what motivated the use of deep uh, NLP or deep uh, uh, knowledge infused learning was this uh, this example that actually it was taken from an electronic health record say you have this uh, this uh, uh, this text of a very uh, of a medical record which is written, written by a clinician and you want to find the entities and relationships it is and this is the outcome that you wanted to expect from it it is not possible to straight away to actually extract all these complex relationship because they are not occurring tremendously large or in large number in your content so they are actually sparse so you what you do is you take a benefit of a uh, a uh, mesh terms. Mesh terms are basically, you can say any paper, you can say, you can take any article. There are keywords in it. You consider mesh terms as those keywords. Consider those keywords as the entities and PubMed articles as the entire source of information. And you're using those uh, keywords 
and as and search them into the articles and look for the all the entities and relationships and subsequently you will actually have a kind of a graph that you create from your knowledge source and you can use that to actually annotate extract subject predicate and object from your unseen text or the text that is given to you uh, given to your system another use case for uh, using the knowledge infusion is considering that there are three people on social media who are talking about who are expressing in the three different way but it is very difficult to identify whether they are actually talking about the same thing or they're talking about the different things so here we called a term known as a medical entity normalization or entity normalization by large which tries to kind of convert or transform these content into a form that in which they have a similar representations and they can be said they can it can be said that they are actually talking about the same thing so we actually created an approach using cnn which talks about uh, which uses a uh, background knowledge in terms of a knowledge graph in this case we used a dsm5 to actually uh, tra convert your entire phrases into some concepts which actually describes those phrases and actually we, those are the phrases that we will be using as an input to the system for classification or our prediction so these are the two major use cases other than that we actually found that uh, 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 that if uh, so this is basically a study that was uh, recently uh, elaborated that says that suppose you use uh, sentiments and emotions and linguistic word counts or any other lexicons that are there in the general uh, general world of information and if you use them in the healthcare domain they do not work and basically the reason is because the in the real world when you talk about the healthcare you need background information at uh, in specific to actually understand the concepts so what we have, what this experiment did was they actually use the sentiment and emotion factors and they use this label which is actually used by the stakeholders or the end users and they wanted to see that if their model can predict those labels correctly and it was seen that that's using sentiments and emotions and other those uh, other uh, linguistic par parameters it is very hard to distinguish between those factors so basically the and as a result of which your model actually do uh, uh, suffer from higher false negatives and though yeah as well as the false in the, which is pretty much uh, comp, uh, important in terms of a healthcare domain so in based on these what are the major questions that have been in the past literature that have arisen is that how do you know that the training set that you have created has a good domain coverage how do you ensure that the consistency of labeling is done especially when the labeling is not binary so this is a case that have been uh, that i will be talking about subsequently that talks about that suppose you are you are actually putting a model into use in a system where you are not aware of the labeling scheme so your labeling is coming from a third party or a third person who are actually using some another resource which you are not aware of and your model needs to be trained on that and do you do uh, and then the question is that do the labels that you have provided provide adequate semantics or they are just simply uh, uh, random labels for example of it would be uh, let's say i talk about high medium low and medium and moderate which have some significance but those significance are dependent upon the threshold that you put so and then do you, uh, do they have adequate domain knowledge so when we say that do they have domain adequate domain knowledge that means that the content are uh, basically the labels that you are providing does do they have any background information which can support their labeling schemes and how do you ensure that your labeling is consistent and uh, and, and this actually raises a concern that uh that when suppose you are actually putting your model into use and your model gives an outcome and when your end user uh, there are five different end users who are evaluating your system and there's an uh, a disagreement between them so you are actually facing an issue because of the consistency in your labeling schemes so with these questions actually motivated a very recent work on snorkel by snorkel uh, which is basically a research lab in stanford which talks about how you move from weak to distant to more like knowledge infused and the idea was of their work was how to create more tr uh, labeled training data so you start with a very little amount of training data and you subsequently over the time you increase your training data so in this process what we are actually focusing in in this talk would be on the weak supervision we do not want too many of the uh, training data but we want to leverage some existing resources to label our, our data points so the the uh, the input would be labeled by some external resource which we know that they have some background knowledge and there is some consistency in that 
so the architecture of the snorkel uh, which is uh, uh, which is in use uh, it takes a very simple form that you have some unlabeled data with you and you have some existing knowledge sources uh, in this in the healthcare domain it can be like uh, like the toxicology databases or patterns or dictionaries or domain heuristics uh, which i will be talking about subsequently as well so consider these to be like a weak supervision resources and what you want to do is you want to you create a hierarchy of your uh, unlabeled data uh, which you can actually consider as a matrix and you have a matrix of your weak supervised uh, or like the knowledge resources and you want to do a you, you want to create a matrix of these two domain and you want to use an optimizer which will learn the mapping between these two domains the context hierarchy and the labeling function and in this process it will generate a weight function which tries to a map from uh, the context uh, from the labeling function to the context hierarchy so that you can have a label for your unlabeled data from your uh, from the additional knowledge resources so in this abstract sense what we essentially what, what we are trying to do is we are trying to bring top down to bottom up together so the top down is we know something is already stored in some databases some knowledge graph and some and things which we know is will work very well in deep learning uh, basically that that's a pattern recognition and what we want to do is we want to bring this thing together in an uh, in in our uh, knowledge infused deep learning paradigm so uh, in theoretically why do we uh, so this what you saw in the previous slide was actually kind of a manifestation of some kind of a theoretical bounds being actually laid down laid uh, on the logics uh, on the logics so the question here is that the equation says that you want to actually want to uh, uh, minimum so the idea is that you have a training error you which you want to be uh, zero uh, sorry for that missing zero so you want a training error to be zero and your testing error should be limited around a basically a defined misclassification error that you want how many number of hypotheses or uh, decision planes would you be generating and this we it came out to be that the number of hypothesis planes that you want to generate depends upon the sample size that you the, depends upon the samples that you have and uh, this samples which is represented by m m is basically the number of uh, uh, training samples and that actually guides your hypothesis and further narrow down the domain you are saying that i i would be putting human annotations and which is actually i would say let's say i uh, i uh, uh, restricts the human annotations to some let's say 0.8 or 0.7 which further restricts the search space so you are using some thresholding mechanisms to reduce your uh, your search space so that your model does the best job but in this process the issue rises on the generalizability and consistency of your classifier and uh, this and also on your confidence that how whether this method or whether this approach will work on other domains or not and the interesting thing is that this complexity this uh, the complexity of a model is actually dependent on the hypothesis which in turn is dependent on the number of samples so example of uh, intentionally what you are trying to say is that if you have a very large number of data sets only then your deep learning model will work and that's actually uh, you are actually uh, 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 associating it with the high complexity of your model so uh, the essentially idea will, uh, of this knowledge infused deep learning is that how we can exploit the domain knowledge so that we can have a less complex architecture which does very well and could actually be infused could actually utilize some conceptual information and in a better way and rather than simply uh, leaning on to the uh, data uh, leaning only on to the uh, deep learning models uh, hypothesis plane so in this process we actually define a tox uh, taxonomy of knowledge infusion which we call as a shallow infusion where we actually tries to be where we actually try to uh, improve or actually enrich the data side of it the semi deep infusion where we are actually trying to uh, add uh, the knowledge into the uh, in the learning domain so in the semi deep we are actually messing around with the uh, with the uh, optimization function as such or the loss function and the deep infusion is where we wanted a knowledge graph to learn in a, in a parallel uh, in a parallel way with your deep learning model uh, so you want the knowledge graph to be guiding your deep learning processes so when you look at shallow infusion there are multiple methods that uh, that are talking about uh, shallow infusion at large uh, there are like bag of words or the phrases from the corpus there are bag of words or phrases from the semantic lexicons 
which you which you can use to actually train your uh, uh, which can actually guide your learning process so rather than having your text generating your feature vectors you know your phrases from semantic lexicon as the feature vectors for your machine learning model then you can actually count of nouns pronouns and verbs are also uh, important in some studies because they are some they form some kind of an expressions on of uh, they actually define some expression of the human behavior and then there are sentiments and emotions uh, which is also another uh, uh, of another parameters uh, in, uh, in as a shell infusion and the latent topics which is basically the lda you can use them to actually describe your uh, sorry uh, you can actually use them. Uh, them to actually describe your uh, input data. So you are saying that uh, I'm rather than running on, rather putting all the words in the text as a feature vector, I will take LDA and I will use that as a feature vector to uh, to uh, understand. Uh, so actually to train my deep learning model. And then there is a label assignment, which is another important uh, uh, way of shell infusion, where we say that you already know what are the different labels and what are their meanings. And you are what you want to do is you want to actually, uh, so for example, Mary sold the book to John. In this case, uh, Mary is basically an agent. Uh, a book is, uh, so uh, the book is basically the theme. Sold uh, is basically the predicate and John is a recipient. So if you know those labels, that also forms a kind of a way of pat a pattern where you can actually uh, uh, explain, you can actually help your model explain why uh, to, uh, so you are actually helping your model to explain the outcomes so and uh, in this so if you have these labels your model will have to have will be requiring less number of training samples to learn rather than having more discrete uh, samples to learn uh, uh, and more number of samples to train which actually increases the complexity of your entire uh, learning process so examples for shallow infusion uh, another goes on to the uh, in the neural network side as well where you say the word to vec which is where you are saying that this is actually uh, a way of representing of your knowledge, but uh, representing of your sentence, but the, the knowledge through word to vec is uh, still syntactic and not semantic as such. And as uh, examples that you have seen in the past, like for example, shelter in place uh, prevents anxiety and shelter in place uh, causes anxiety is basically uh, have the same representation in word to vec or any other deep learning model. An interesting uh, 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 add on to the word to vec, which, which kind of uh, resolves this kind of issue was a retrofitting. So retrofitting uh, is a basically a mechanism which uses nearest neighbor algorithm to actually uh, use to, to actually understand the similarity between these terms in the semantic lexicon and use that to actually move around the, uh, the, the words in the vector spaces. And adding to that would be the BERT, which talks about, let's say, we, uh, we say that we rather than using um, uh, lexicon, we uh, try to learn sentence representation in a better way going from uh, so from going from uh, left to right and from right to left as well as keeping in line what are the words which are important but in all those cases the bigger drawback is that uh, these models requires large amount of data still to actually train and they and not all the samples really uh, exist in the real world so we actually look at, we studied this uh, movement uh, from uh, over the time. And though they are not like, they are actually, their development has not been chronological, but more or less what to work and glow for the initial uh, embedding models, then retrofitting and pass was actually tries to use semantic lexicon and knowledge base to improve those embeddings. And moving further was the fast text. We say this rather, if you are, if you are facing issues with the sparsity and out of vocabulary, why not train training? Why not generating embeddings at the character level? And then moving forward was Elmo and transformers, which are actually uh, being used uh, in a transfer learning paradigm as such, because uh, they have they are not pretty. Uh, so they require a large amount of data to actually train. So it is very hard for to train a transformer only specific to your task. So taking an example of the, so we actually explain an example of retrofitting example, uh, retrofitting, which actually uh, we used in uh, a crisis scenario in social media. Considering this, that you have a, a you use a word embedding model, any or like word to work, bird or uh, glove, anything. So you, you project their embeddings onto the coordinate planes. You see the damage population infrastructure and affected are discreetly uh, and, uh, are organized on the coordinate plane. And what you want to do is you leverage the semantic ontology, like the mock, empathy, disaster, DVPedia, any of any uh, resource, 
And what is you want to do is you want to bring these things together so that, you know, infrastructure and damage are actually together. They are make sense and population and affected together. They make sense. So this is basically a kind of a retrofitting example, which says that whatever you are a representation, is, it is, or you take bird, bird or any out of the box embedding model and you use semantic lexicon to actually retrofit. Uh, you actually move your, uh, uh, your dots along the coordinate plane to actually make sense out of it. Another example that we found uh, where we saw the utility of knowledge graph was to find an association between social media and electronic health records. So what we actually did was uh, we know that how people express themselves on social media in different forms on mental health where and but we need some form of background knowledge to actually categorize. So we, as I said uh, in the previous slide as well, what we essentially did was we actually used the social media content. We train, we actually generated uh, basically the, uh, uh, the embeddings using uh, BERT. And what we did was we then we actually cluster them using TSNE. And then we, once we have the clusters, we know what are those topics that have been talking about in those clusters. We use a background, uh, a, a background knowledge in terms of this, the medical knowledge sources to actually label those clusters uh, into based on the categories that are being specified in these knowledge sources. We do the same for the electronic health records to find the similarity between the users. So based on this, we found that we identified self-harm, depressive feelings, and ideations are the latent topics expressed in both of the domains, whereas both of the domains did not express these uh, concepts of impulsivity, family violence, and drug abuse, which in turn are actually a kind of an insight that you want to derive and you want to see that what are the things that are being, you can actually capture and what are the things that you cannot capture. And the, the benefit of the knowledge graph is basically to actually help you find those labels precisely. Moving on to the semi-deep infusion. In semi-deep infusion, uh, we are actually moving, uh, we are talking about uh, as an attention mechanism and to learn knowledgeable constraints. So these are the two uh, prominent methods so far that have been uh, uh, developed and used where you can actually ex bring external knowledge to your knowledge infusion paradigm. So uh, just to recap on to what shell uh, just a recap to compare between shell infusion and, uh, and uh, semi-deep infusion, what we want to do is, so in the shell infusion is, so you all have a data set and what you want to do is you want to improve the data set or enrich the data set with some external knowledge. And in that uh, enriched data set, you pass, you pass that modified data set to a deep learning model and you get some kind of an outcome. And what you want to do is you want to do a hypothesis testing or a kind of a, a, a cosine similarity based verification between the outcome that you have and the outcome and your external knowledge, which was used to improve the data set. So that's a shallow infusion. Semi-deep infusion on the other hand is it tries to allow, it gives you an opportunity to actually uh, generate attention and kind of like a probability values, or you can say uh, kind of you can say attention. You can say also use uh, use it as a dropout. And what you want to do is you want to modify the deep learning loss function uh, through these uh, 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 through the external knowledge, and that becomes uh, in a form of a weight matrix. And what you so once you have a weight matrix, you calculate the similarity. Uh, you calculate the similarity between the weight matrix that you use to train your model and the and the weight matrix that you got as an outcome. So that's the, the that's a weight metric that the model is uh, that the model has learned. And that you you can based on that you can actually understand how far and how close is your model uh, to the uh, to the true or external knowledge. So that's an example for the semi-deep infusion. So external knowledge through attention actually goes through a hard attention and a soft attention and attention with the knowledge base. In a hard attention mechanism, you know the importance of the entities and relationship and you hard code that in the model. So what do you say that suppose I have an embedding of, a, of certain words and what we want to do is we want to imp, uh, modulate or you want to change the embeddings of those words by multiplying them by some uh, some attention weights which say that these words are more important than the other, other words which is kind of a very similar to a kind of a TFIDF measure where you rather than calculating the TFIDF uh, vectors, you're, you're calculating TFIDF scores and you are actually uh, changing your uh, embedding models. In the soft retention mechanism, you are actually trying to use some kind of a similarity uh, measures, which is through an embedding. So what you can say is that you are uh, you know a very big uh, model, uh, and you uh, we can say a, a model which is being trained on a very large data set. You use the weights of that model to actually 
learn the weights of your so you use the weights of that model to actually guide your uh, learning in a small data set so that's kind of a small uh, soft attention which for example which will be a teacher student framework as well as there are examples other examples would be knowledge dist distillation and then there is an attention with the knowledge base which we will be talking about in the next uh, in subsequent in the slides so there's an another case would be the external knowledge through learnable constraints and here the learnable constraints are through axioms so you want you want to do an axiomatic uh, knowledge and you want to uh, so axiomatic knowledge is basically the rules so you you your rules are guiding your uh, your model learning uh, you can use a kl divergence as another measure to actually uh, define your rules for your model you can use a common sense knowledge graph such as concept net to actually constrain for example uh, you have a relationship let's say a related to b is uh, is is what is your model is learning when, whereas your concept net says your a is not related to b so you want to actually put this as a hard rule or hard constraint in your model so that your model does not learns a, a is related to b so this is where concept net comes in another utility of concept net is basically that suppose you have you are learning on a social media content where there are multiple languages in the content so uh you, in general trend is to ignore those languages but you what you can do is you can use concept net to actually convert those languages into english in a same form and in a, in a process that you actually preserve the semantics and the other other constraint that you can put as on the specific categories of nlp where you can actually put constraints on synonyms antonyms and homonyms so those are another ways where you can actually put constraint on uh, on on your uh, in your model learning so you say that synonyms are more closer to each other they have a more similarity values antonyms needs to be have are dissimilar they need to be uh, they should have a minimum similarity so those kind of a constraints can actually help in uh, in actually infusing the knowledge into your um, deep learning paradigm so something along this line there are another another chronological sequence of uh, different uh, works that have been done in the past in semi deep infusion which talks about uh, so one is uh, teacher forcing which i was talking about where you forcefully uh, allow make the model learn a particular uh, uh, sentence professor forcing is basically where you use a uh, a kind of a a, a trained uh, a highly trained model to uh, and use the base of the trained model to guide your uh, short task assuming that there is some dependency or some distributional association between those two tasks moving next would be the neural attention model where you say put self attentions and knowledge guided attention where uh, in the knowledge guided attention what essentially is uh, what attention is does uh, what attention what essentially does is that uh, you have uh, uh, an lstm model and in the lstm model you have lstm cells in the lstm cells every next uh, uh, movement of the uh, uh, representation of the hidden state is uh, by default what you want to do is you want to use a knowledge graph in the middle to actually guide Uh, to actually modulate your hidden representations if it is if it is divergent from the uh, from the uh, input data so that's basically a way of guiding the knowledge and similarly the knowledge guided gans is another way of uh, using uh, of using semi deep infusion so let's take an example of a learnable constraint to be more uh, to actually concretize on this thought so suppose you have a, a, a sentence uh, which is basically the fill in the blanks and uh, in this fill in the blanks you want to actually uh, give uh, response to this uh, sentence and you have a target sentence right uh, for for now just consider that i have only a, a, a sentence uh, the complete form of the sentence as a target but you can actually replace the sentence with a knowledge graph or a resource and what you do is you are actually training a generative model to actually uh, to uh, take this input and actually predict some uh, uh, some random words in uh, to actually form a complete sentence but uh, in order to train a generative model you need a kind of, so generative model is by default they can actually generate random uh, words which may or may not make sense so in order to guide that uh, that uh, this uh, the generated sentence is meaningful what you want to do is you are actually add, uh, adding a constraint in this constraint is in terms of a kl divergence where you assume that you have a, a, a target sentence which you know is a completely complete form and what you want to do is you want to minimize the kl divergence between every prediction that the user uh, that the sentence is being uh, so every prediction that the generative model is making and the the target sentence so you are trying to say that every time the generative model is making some some uh, prediction 
you are trying to calculate the KL divergence between that sentence and the target sentence. In this process, the the generative model time uh, generative model over the time learns on what is the right uh, word to be fit on in those fill in the blanks. So this is basically the uh, the idea of for the learnable uh, constraints. So you are actually using KL divergence to actually to uh, find the mapping between these two uh, uh, the predictions by the generative model and the target sentence. Uh, taking another example of uh, uh, the GANs in a more precise sense, where so in the previous sense, uh, I was I was actually talking about uh, uh, filling filling the blanks. Basically, I have the source uh, source uh, where I want to uh, I will be check I will be giving a response to, and there's a target. In the uh, in a different sense, suppose you have a seen data and you have an unseen data, right? And you want to generate predictions for the unseen categories. And you want to use, uh, and you are using GANs for that. So what you want to do is, you are actually using a generative, a, a generate two generators. One generator would be training, will be our training on the seen categories. Another generator would be training on the unseen categories. And uh, so, uh, so as as I said in the previous slide, a generator will generate some fake data, some fake representation. And you have a real data with you, which is your training sample. And you are training. You are already training a discriminator, and the discriminator is actually trying to uh, uh, help generator learns better representation of its fake data. But there is no guide gu guide for the uh, unseen categories. So what we essentially do is that we uh, what the 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 weights of the uh, of the generator one, which is being trained with the guidance from the discriminator, we share the parameters between these two. So the parameters of the generator one is being shared with the parameters of generator two to in a in kind of an embedding regression framework. And you act as a result of which it makes two predictions, the prediction by G1, and the prediction G2, because we G2 is being guided by G1. That's why we need to keep these two predictions together. And the loss function is basically a kind of a similarity between the embeddings of the unseen categories. Now here you actually use the knowledge graph uh, embeddings to uh, actually guide your learning process. So knowledge graph has those embeddings of those unseen categories, and you want to find the, the similarity between your prediction and the, uh, your, your prediction would be nothing but a vector, your prediction and your, and the embedding of the unseen categories. And over the time you back propagate and you're, you're actually train over, so, uh, over uh, so you actually make a prediction of your unseen categories, help uh, taking help from seen categories. A very nice example of this uh, would uh, is basically that uh, you want uh, to you are using uh, uh, you have some uh, some examples of let's say uh, uh, red flowers or uh, flowers of red colors and if your model is given the flower of purple color your model will just simply ignore it because it doesn't form in the same same category but in this process you are actually giving some kind of uh, labels to the unseen categories based on the labels that you have for the seen categories. And something very similar it can be done in the LSTMs as well, where you actually train your uh, sequence uh, LSTMs. And what you do is at the end of the uh, hidden representation, you, you, you actually mix your hidden representation with your knowledge graph representations, right, in this case. And so that you can actually uh, improve your representations by this augmentation. So far, what we have seen is that we add some information and the model does well because we are actually adding some kind of information which happens to be uh, the uh, kind of which we think would be more helpful because we know that they are belonging to the same domain. But a deeper infusion is basically what a vision that we actually making. The reason is that in, in the previous process, we know that the knowledge graph uh, needs to be uh, a knowledge graph representation are being added to the hidden representations in terms of like addition, multiplication, concatenations, or you, you, you can use a multi-layer perceptron as a way of uh, mixing it. And what we wanted to do is, uh, we do not know how much of this knowledge graph representation or knowledge graph information is required in a deep learning process. And that makes a question for the deep infusion and things that we are right now working in as in, a, in an ongoing research, where we want to guide the deep learning model with a, uh, with a subgraph, uh, with a uh, knowledge graph, with a process that we want it to, we want it to be measured. Uh, we want to actually put a kind of a stopper where we actually measure how much information is to be added to the deep learning model 
to in order to guide its learning process. So that's the whole idea of the deep infusion. So the deep infusion is you're actually guiding, you're actually adding your knowledge graph information to your deep learning network, but in a guided form. So you're actually checking the loss of information uh, that is incurred by your model learning over the time. So in this, all this process of semi-deep infusion and infusion and uh, uh, in, uh, in semi-deep, shallow and deep, what are the basic objective functions and evaluations being used so far? So the objective functions, as I said, is pretty, uh, pretty much right now is the KL, uh, KL divergence, which is being used tremendously in variation order encoders, LSTMs, GANs, and CME's neural networks. And, the, and in various frameworks like zero-shot learning, one-shot learning, transfer learning, and parameter sharing. And what you can use the other variants of KL divergence, which is Jensen and Shannon, depending on the similarity and, and uh, in, in, based on the symmetricity and anti-symmetric uh, anti nature of your problem. And, the, and there's another way of uh, through integer linear programming. In terms of the evaluations, uh, apart from the precision recall in EFSCO, which is the traditional, uh, you can use, so the fresh uh, inception distance is also another measure to check the similarity between your training data and the knowledge graph, and that guides your learning process. Uh, hypothesis testing is still another way of evaluating. Uh, word and concept features uh, maps through TSNE is another way of representing. And another interesting that we actually used uh, in our recent work was the area under the perturbation curve, which checks, uh, which basically gives you a better feature ranking. So you, you might not need all the features uh, in your uh, prediction, and you want to check that uh, how many of the features is required to actually uh, uh, to actually basically uh, to actually learn your better representation as well as your uh, your model is getting better performance with that number of features. And the last is the human centric evaluation, which is crowdsourcing, user satisfaction, mental models, or the trust assessment or correctability. How correct is your outcome? So uh, based on these uh, uh, infrastructures and structure that we have actually come up uh, across in the past on the, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, on the optimization as well as learning, uh, let me walk you through the, some of the uh, use cases where we actually saw the knowledge infused learning to be doing pretty well. Considering this uh, a very simple problem statement that you are actually having a one-to-one -one conversation with a person. In this case, we take an example of a clinical diagnostic interviews where there's a person and there's a clinician who is interacting with each other. And we have a bunch of questions and bunch of answers are there from the, from this interview. And uh, what we want to do is we want to generate a summary of this interview. So this is a uh, pretty, uh, pretty much architecture that we actually, uh, uh, we, you can come up with where you have a conversations, you want to filter the conversations based on some uh, keywords you want to actually uh, modulate your, uh, so you want to actually uh, modulate, so you want to modulate your embeddings because you want to make them more real, more close to your domain specific information and you want to remove the garbage and you want to actually uh, uh, improve your language model as well because your language model is generic. So you want to change your embedding model and you want to change your language model because those are two generic models. And you want to put them into a you know, optimization framework so that you can actually optimize on your linguistic quality and informativeness. So just uh, to uh, just to keep it short, assuming uh, let's take an assumption that uh, you have an interview script of slice as J, and you use a text rank, which is a pretty uh, pretty much uh, a well known algorithm, to uh, create a graph. You create a path, a graph of this interview script. So you have the words, and they are being associated with each other through a graph. And you, uh, what you do is you actually uh, use a linguistic for linguistic quality. You use a trigram language model, and in, the, in that trigram language model, you want to generate. The, you are actually calculate the probabilities of uh, of different words. <clears throat> sorry, and uh, sorry, and uh, so this is a trigram language model, and there's a, a sentence length, which is basically the length of your summaries. So you want uh, sorry length of your sentence, which you want to uh, you are actually optimizing on. On this, you are actually using WSS, which is basically a word semantic score. A word semantic score is basically the, the score of that word or the importance of this word in that domain specific knowledge source. In this case, we are, let's take a very simple example of a lexicon. You know the lexicon has some words and you know the importance of those, those words in the lexicon. You use that to actually uh, to tweak your language model. 
and you put all this framework into an ILP frame, uh, ILP form, which is a basically an integer learning, uh, uh, integer learning, uh, uh, integer linear programming paradigm, and which actually gives you the fine, uh, gives you a best path for an interview slice. So what happens in this case is that you have we train this we use this uh, uh, architecture in the clinical diagnostic interviews. We use BERT, which gives you a, a very a random, very generic information. We move it further to use ILP, which gives you better uh, results simply using linguistic in uh, quality and informativeness. And further, if you use a PHQ-9, you get a much better representation, a much, a much better re uh, response to this uh, for this uh, uh, for the, uh, interview. <clears throat> So, uh, uh, so this was one example. The another example that we actually tested on for the knowledge infusion was linking the Reddit to the DSM-5. So uh, Reddit, as you know, is a social media platform. DSM-5 is a place, basically a clinical resource where you are, which is basically, basically being used by the stakeholders or the uh, mental health uh, healthcare providers. And suppose the Reddit, in a, in a Reddit, you take a person who is suffering from borderline personality disorder and these are this is the post that he makes on social on Reddit, and be, uh, be the model predicts different categories of uh, uh, of uh, base, different categories of DSM-5, which is uh, dissociative disorder, which is DICD, personality disorder, substance abuse disorder, uh, social behavior, and OCD. So these are basic predominant categories that you will, that you, that you uh, will be thrown out by the model based on this input. And then what you do is then this person switch to a different subreddit and it uh, posts somewhere over there. And the model actually takes that into account and gives a series of predictions. And over the time, when the person actually back, comes back to the same place, he talks about the same pro process, but keeping that hierarchy, that movement in the past in, in this uh, picture, you are able to give a more precise label to this person, which was not given in the first instance. So you are actually using the knowledge graph information of DSM-5 to, uh, to actually guide or to monitor the movement of the user. And uh, to conceptualize this in a better way, uh, take this example of the same person, uh, his first post, what we essentially do is, we know that the person is talking about bisexuality and relationship, which in a SNOMED CT, which is a knowledge graph, is able to basically talk about the health related behavior findings and relationship is also talks about, is also related to a health related behavior findings and these two are similar. Definitely these two are actually associated and are talking about the same concept in, in, in that particular sentence. And something very similar is like worthlessness, which is captured through the association of feeling hopelessness because there's some uh, association between the hopelessness and, uh, and uh, worthlessness. And something very similar is the intrusive thoughts and uh, other is like the obsessive, uh, obsessiveness. And that was the reason why the model in the first place Gave gave an uh, obsessive compulsive disorder as an outcome because there was an association between between uh, the obsessive word and the obsessive compulsive compulsive uh, personality disorder in in uh, in SNOMED CT. So in this mapping process, we actually uh, follows a very simple pipeline. The pipeline is basically we actually create engrams, LDAs, and uh, topics and uh, over the uh, subreddit or uh, over the Reddit content. And what we want to do is we actually use this knowledge graph to act. So we have a graph. So the graph uh, have nodes and relationships in there. So what we want to do is you want to find uh, the similarity, the cosine similarity between the phrases and the topics that we have extracted between the cons and the concepts in this graph. And we put a threshold on uh, on that concept. As I said in the previous slide, the, on the probability, probably approximate correct learning that we actually do the thresholding to actually minimize the search space. And that results in a, a, a new label data set where we have the Reddit, but we replace the subreddit labels with the DSM-5 labels. Let's take a, 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 this output as in this format, which is basically a matrix. As I said, in the snorkel as well, we actually create a matrix between the, uh, between the input, uh, between the subreddit, which is uh, already labeled, uh, ca category and the unlabeled uh, and the labeled is basically the DSM-5 and we are, but the DSM-5 is the knowledge which we know has definitions and we want to actually map the map the DSM-5 categories to the mental health uh, uh, related uh, uh, subreddits which are there on social media. So you're labeling the social media data using the background knowledge uh, based on their mappings. 
Uh, now, how does it happen? Is that task? Uh, let's uh, let's keep it a task of bipolar subreddit, where uh, there is this example of this person, and the model highlights the words which they it has able to find some similarity in the graph. And the and the task of the model is to actually find the best DSM five DSM five categories that would be actually be more appropriate for this uh, text. And that happens because uh, the words in this, uh, which are being underlined in the bipolar, are actually being described in a depression-related uh, graph. So they actually have some similarities. And we do this thing on all of the subreddits. So you are actually, in the sense, you are actually minimizing your variations uh, in the uh, in the categories. And as a, as a result of which, you have much better prediction and much better agreement with the end users. So uh, mathematically, how does it work? Uh, you have embeddings of all the words uh, in the Reddit, which you I told you about the engrams and the topics, and you have the embeddings of the concepts in the DSM-5. And what you want to do is you want to learn this weight matrix W, which is a mapping between from the social media sphere to a more uh, authoritative uh, source, which is DSM-5. And what you want, and in this process, we uh, we want to uh, find. Uh, this uh, weight function, which we start initiate with a very large number, and over the time we reduce this weight to be more appropriate. So we consider it as uh, we make it as a minimization function, and if you uh, uh, differentiate it, it it basically forms a kind of a a, a, a solvable a linear time algorithm, which is basically something very similar to y equals to mx plus c. And uh, in a very uh, abstract sense, uh, what this function actually talks about encoding from DSM five to Reddit. Which is basically moving from this uh, more uh, uh, knowledge source to a more weak source, and you want to actually do a mapping from the decoding from the Reddit uh, from the to the DSM-5, which is another uh, uh, which is a backward of it. So you want to actually optimize for the both side. When we saw this and we compared with the uh, state of the art, we actually saw that the state of the art algorithm, which is uh, done in 2017, which was also published in the Nature Scientific Report. Uh, has showed a 13% uh, uh, false alarm rate, but when we used our approach of domain-specific uh, curation, we are able to get a, a, a significant decline in the false alarm uh, of 2.5% on the uh, on the mapping between the social media, uh, uh, on the basically mapping the social media to the uh, the real uh, uh, mental health sphere. So the labeling was actually correct, and when we wanted to verify it. We actually sent it the outcome to uh, the annotators who are actually the mental health care providers, and we got an 84% agreement with this approach. So, uh, in short, uh, what we actually achieved in this entire process is that there is Reddit, uh, which we are uh, the social media, you can replace it with Twitter, and we have different knowledge sources for it. And these knowledge sources are Snowmed CT, which talks about, which gives you the treatment related information. Twitter ADR and all of the lexicon give you observation and drug related informations. And DSM-5, which gives you the mental health related informations. And the suicide risk severity lexicon, which gives you the different levels of risk. And in turn, these information allows you to map the EHR with social media, which is uh, which is fascinating and getting a, like an 84% agreement was uh, remarkable for us because this was completely an unsupervised approach. We did not use any supervised labels in our training or, or actually our labeling process. So knowledge infusion was actually a kind of a way where we labeled the uh, social media content using an authoritative source uh, and uh, through a process where we actually know that, uh, that the authoritative source is actually correct and we got, that actually guided the, uh, the training process. In this process, we actually created a lot of resources, uh, which is basically which we created the lexicons for um, uh, these all lexicons are created on social media, on Twitter and Reddit, and they actually map the, uh, the Twitter phrases and Twitter content onto the uh, real uh, real world data uh, on the uh, mental health care. Uh, or basically, you can say that these are all uh, phrases in the uh, in the social media which is being mapped to the uh, which are being mapped to the uh, uh, mental health sphere. Or we can say a more uh, authoritative knowledge graph. So they are all being mapping. The, these uh, resources are, have mappings between the social media and the knowledge graph. Uh, some of the other works that we have not uh, we have not covered, but I would be very happy to take uh, that in the uh, questions as well. The first work was a knowledge aware assessment of severity of suicide risk, 
where we actually trained a CNN model, where we changed the loss function of the CNN model to take into consideration the, uh, the disagreement between the annotators. So if, suppose your model is giving a prediction and you check with the five different people and they all disagree. So you actually have to penalize your model training so that the model actually gives a more concise uh, prediction. So that was the first study in this thing. And the second was basically to analyze uh, how the time variant and time invariant uh, movement of users on social media can be, uh, can be better assessed with CSSRS or with any authoritative source. Uh, authoritative, uh, uh, source. Another work was uh, that uh, that we wanted, but that we are actually currently working on, is basically recommending users on social media by leveraging the content and the movement of uh, uh, already existing users. So if I'm moving around on the social media on Reddit among different platforms, different forums, how I can actually uh, use background knowledge in some knowledge graph to actually be very be very precise on my movement on my topics and help thus help the uh, those top thus use those topics to actually find the person who will be who are actually more similar to in in terms of semantic sense in terms of conversations as well and uh, and these are like uh, references and i give my uh, uh, give the screen to the next speaker who is talking about who will be talking about the use of knowledge infused learning in terms of resolving the ethics uh, in, in ethics ethical issues biases on social media content. And uh, before we move, uh, it's time for a short uh, online coffee break. And we I am happy to take any questions uh, from the audience. Okay, we'll get together, get back at 4.44 uh, and promptly start at 4.45, there are no questions. If there are a pause um, to stop recording, that'd be great. So, and we can see start when we again get back. Okay. Everybody's here, yeah. Okay. Um, hi everyone. So my name is Uwer uh, Kurshunju and uh, I'll continue talking about the uh, how, how, an, how an external knowledge plays role in the cyber social threats domain. Uh, what, is the, what, what is the difference that's making in general uh, when you involve an external knowledge in this, uh, in this kind of important domain because uh, the implications are, 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 are kind of uh, very huge and we are uh, experiencing in the real world the implications of these already. So um, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, in general some critical points on cyber social threats and in general, what's the role of knowledge on improving the models uh, for these critical points? So, first of all, the context in social media conversations, especially for the cyber social threats uh, problems. So it can be uh, some misinformation problem or it can be fake news problem or it can be extremism uh, or it can be harassment. So all these concepts or, or the problems on social media, uh, so we don't have a very clear definitions of these and uh, the meaning of the concepts or the language that people use. 
So there is no any black and white. There are a lot of shades of gray uh, in, in, in social media area. So the context or the capturing the uh, uh, correct context is very crucial uh, to be able to uh, model uh, the conversations for, uh, for these problems on social media. Uh, on the other hand, the false alarms in the, in the models that are deployed or developed or deployed on social media, uh, so the implications of these false alarms are huge. So uh, in general, if you are developing a machine learning model, so there is going to be some, uh, uh, some error in your model to some extent, and even your, your false alarms is quite uh, small, so the implications are going to be very huge. So as long as uh, if, if you can make some improvement on the false alarm reduction in your model, so that is going to be a huge or significant uh, 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 significant plus. On the other hand, some ethical consider considerations are quite important. For example, the bias and the transparency in your model, uh, how your model is making decisions. So if your model is biased or not, how did you train your model? What kind of algorithms you're using? So uh, the, the data sets or the algorithms being created by the people and how these people are, uh, are creating their biases or how they are trying to unbias themselves. So there are a lot of questions around these uh, considerations and the implications of, the, of, of these uh, considerations or ethical issues uh, on the mass populations is uh, quite uh, significant. Uh, so we are trying to uh, use external knowledge on um, improving the models that we can use uh, to, to address these critical points. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some use cases that we had been work that we that we have been working on so far, online extremism, and how we uh, incorporate the external knowledge and how we are uh, what we find out that we can actually address these issues to some extent, uh, incorporating certain knowledge. So the online extremism, uh, many online platforms on social media, uh, so the current efforts are actually inadequate uh, considering the number of users that the online platforms has and any kind of uh, extremism that the people are being exposed to and their consequences. So. Uh, there are serious consequences of these uh, efforts uh, in the real world. So for that reason, governments insist that uh, the industry partners or social media com uh, companies, they have to do more actually to remove these harmful content from their platforms. So for that reason, if this problem continues to be unsolved, uh, social media platforms are going to uh, con continue to negatively impact the society. So on the other hand, uh, we are in a global pandemic, COVID-19. So extremism is actually being spread uh, because people are basically uh, spending more time on social media when they are in, uh, when they are staying at home. So that means they are being exposed to that kind of information much more often. So for that reason, especially young population, they are being exposed to this kind of problems or the uh, narratives or, or the conversations much more often. So they are, they are able to radicalize people uh, much easier these days. So on the other hand, this is, a, this is not a very trivial que uh, question or the problem. So there are, there are different challenges uh, for this issue and uh, there are some potential solutions. So they are still uh, in, the, uh, in, in the experimentation phase. So first of all, the people or the actors, the bad actors on social media, they are quite persuasive. So the content that they are uh, employing on, on their social media and the psychological uh, tactics uh, that they're employing on social media is quite impressive because uh, they are able to convince people to take action uh, on their ideology. So they are not only convincing people into their ideology, but they are convincing people to take action at the end. So on the other hand, the content that they uh, employ is multidimensional. So for example, they're very often using uh, mainstream resources to uh, convey their messages. 
So for example, for the Islamist extremism content, uh, so many concepts that, the, that you can find in the mainstream religious resources, for example, jihad, uh, so they're using these terms in different meanings to, uh, to repurpose them uh, that is, so that it's going to serve their ideology. So it is quite difficult to capture these different dimensions of the uh, um, of, of these concepts or the or the, or the language pieces uh, in their uh, in their content. So th there needs to be some different strategy uh, uh, that we can use to be able to automatically uh, capture these um, the these narratives. On the other hand, we need to. We need to think about more um, um, modeling users. So, since these people are focusing or targeting targeting individual users, uh, so mostly these people are uh, are targeting these individual users, and these people are uh, recruiting are able to recruit these people as well. So, for that reason, uh, so they are employing some tactics uh, to be able to uh, to be able to convince these people on the other hand radicalization is not actually just one phase uh, process so it is actually it is it's a multi-stage process so there are different stages of radicalization so the people may be in some stage of this radicalization process so we should be able to model these users with respect to the different dimensions that is represented in different stages of the radicalization. So on, on the other hand, domain knowledge is critical. For example, Islamist extremism is just one problem uh, in that domain, cyber, cyber social threats domain. So you cannot generalize this problem uh, and just uh, just handle with other type of extremism, for example, white supremacy, because there are a lot of nuances uh, in this domain, and you have you should be able to capture these nuances and semantic nuances uh, using some techniques. So for that reason, whatever uh, external domain knowledge you are using, it needs to be specific to this domain, Islamist extremism domain, uh, and it needs to be created by uh, the, the domain experts. So these four different uh, challenges that you that, that we need to recognize first so that we can come up with some potential solutions. So as I mentioned before, so the radicalization is just a process uh, overall, and we are collaborators, uh, uh, political science domain expert uh, in the religious extremism domain. So he created this scale, the radicalization scale that is going to define the radicalization process that people go through. So it just starts from uh, non-extremists, so there's nothing actually in, the, uh, in, in, in that particular person's content uh, regarding any uh, signal uh, for extremism, uh, but it can, it can develop over time. So we can ident identify some indicators that is going to indicate some level of radicalization over time. So it can go up to the severe level where uh, the person can actually take action uh, to be able to uh, to be able to just serve 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 their ideology or serve serve the uh, extremist group that that the person is uh, thinking that's belong to, uh, belonging to. So the analysis of the content. Uh, in different contexts and in different uh, dimensions. So it can provide very deep understanding all the factors characterizing the radicalization process. So for example, uh, when you think about the radicalization process and how people uh, are uh, using the narratives or the language in each of, uh, in different stages of radicalization. So what you can see is in the beginning stages of extremism, so you can see some more of religious rhetoric or religious content and religious context. On the other hand, in uh, starting maybe from like the first and second, the low and elevated stages, so you can see more ideological content. Uh, so 
then you can uh, convince that person to your uh, ideology. So then you can introduce some more uh, action-wise uh, uh, language. So you can convince that person to take action uh, and maybe hate other uh, other people, the the, the so-called enemies of the of the group, or uh, you can actually convince that the person to take action and go violent, for example, and harm others, uh, maybe uh, in his or her own country or uh, somewhere else uh, in the world. So to be able to capture the person uh, in uh, different stages of radicalization, then we have to break down the content into different dimensions and we have to capture the the, the different contextual uh, signals in different uh, stages so that we can uh, have a deeper understanding of the content and all the factors. So which uh, dimension or which contextual signals are playing what role in what part of the uh, radicalization process. So we need to remember here, uh, whatever the model we come up with. So it is going to, let's say uh, one social media company or platform uh, use some machine learning model or some kind of a model that uh, they create and deploy in their platform. So whatever the model they are coming, on, uh, coming up with, uh, so it is going to have some local and global security implications. So for that reason, uh, we need to have some reliable and fair uh, models to predict uh, some online uh, terrorist activities or extremist activities. So what we mean by that here is, so for example, uh, as I said before, uh, your model is going to have some uh, misclassifications or errors, right? So then you have to think about this, the implications of these errors or misclassifications, how your users or how the population in your platform is going to be affected. So if you are misclassifying an innocent person as, a, uh, as an extremist or, or, or a terrorist, so that is a very big problem. So if you are thinking about talking about some, uh, even 1% error or misclassification. So let's say you have 1 billion users uh, in your platform. So 1% misclassification is going to be a lot of number of users. So this is a huge uh, security implications. So that we shouldn't allow any kind of uh, platform to socially unfair uh, uh, unfairly treating their, their, their users or other people. So uh, we are using some uh, Twitter data uh, that, that were uh, uh, verified by Twitter uh, as they are extremist users. And uh, we are also using some non-extremist user data uh, that contains only Muslim users. So just explore, exploring the data that we have, what is in the data? Uh, so what can we actually see uh, when we uh, look at the data or, or the content that we have? So what we saw here is uh, the topics and the key phrases that you can extract from the, uh, from the content. So what we see here is there are three different dimensions that you can uh, clearly see uh, the one is religion, ideology, and hate. So, uh, for example, for the extremist content, so there is no much religious content. On the other hand, there are a lot of uh, ideology content that you can see over here. On the other hand, there are a significant number of uh, hateful speech uh, that you can see over here talking about some uh, basically uh, harming other people or other, uh, other group of people. So for that reason, we decided to identify some uh, different dimensions or contextual dimensions uh, of the content. And based on the literature and the empirical study of the data that we have, uh, we identified them as religion, ideology, and hate so that we can uh, so, so we can have a deeper understanding of the of the language and uh, and how we can represent these uh, this content from uh, using the, these different uh, dimensions. So the main reason that we want to do that, uh, as I said before, 
the same language or the same content that these extremist people are using. The same language or the same content or concepts or phrases, they are being used by the non-extremist people as well. So as I mentioned before, uh, as an example, jihad example. So the meaning of the jihad is actually uh, very peaceful in, in an Islamic literature. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, it, it's, its meaning is uh, self-struggle to become a better person, for example. On the other hand, the extremist groups are taking that uh, concept and assigning a new meaning to that concept as uh, to be able to serve your ideology, then you have to do jihad, then, then you have to take action and then uh, harm other people or hate uh, other people, uh, basically. So how you can disintegrate the, uh, these, these kind of important terms or diagnostic terms so that you can actually capture uh, the true meaning of these uh, very important uh, terminology in the content so that you can uh, come up with a more reliable model. So it's going to uh, give outcome uh, that is going to be more fair um, and uh, less biased. So uh, just an example for jihad. So you can see just three different uh, example for jihad here, the tweets uh, from the data set. And uh, the first one is just very, very peaceful tweet. The person is talking about uh, 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 being kind uh, and this is his or her jihad. On the other hand, the other person on the right hand side is talking about some killing other people and this is his or her jihad, right? And on the other hand, uh, ideological uh, context, so the jihad is, uh, is just about the the nation or being some uh, political organization and this is jihad for them so how to distinguish them from from each other and how you can uh, uh, how you can uh, approach this problem so to be able to just uh, visualize this ambiguity in general so we want to visualize this how you can actually uh, uh, see in different uh, dimension or, or uh, for each dimension how the jihad is being represented uh, in a vector space. So as you can see here for the extremist people, so the jihad is very close to the awwaki, uh, aqidah or Allah or, or sheikh or Islamic state media. So awwaki is, if you, if you may know, uh, is a very well-known ideologue for the ISIS, uh, Islamic state. Uh, and Islamic State media is the uh, main media organization. It was main media organization for the Islamic State as well. So on the other hand, for non-extremists, so it is just about Imams or Quran or Muslims. So it is actually not that uh, ideolo ideologically um, relevant. All right, so what we, uh, our approach here is so we are creating contextual dimensions uh, for the content and we can use uh, both knowledge graphs or, or, or corpora for each of the model. And in this one, we are using, uh, uh, we are using three dimensions and for each of the dimensions, we are using different resources. So as I said before, religion, ideology and hate. So we are using Quran and Hadith for the religion, uh, the, for the religion dimension and for the ideology, we are using books and lectures of ideologues and also the do uh, documentation uh, that we uh, obtained from the uh, internet that was published by ISIS before. And we are using hate speech corpus uh, to be able to model the, uh, the hate speech uh, that ISIS was employing uh, on social media. Uh, since we are breaking down uh, this overall language in general into different dimensions, so this can be applied to other social, me social media problems or social problems as well. So uh, we can capture similarity uh, between the uh, words or between the uh, 
phrases or concepts in the language using knowledge graph. Uh, so, so, so we can just uh, measure the distance between concepts in a knowledge graph. On the other hand, we can use a corpus uh, to be able to capture similarity or uh, measure distance between, between these concepts as well. Uh, the basic idea here is, so in both of them, uh, we actually uh, represent the meaning of these keywords or, or, the, or these concepts uh, based on the surrounding keywords that we use. So uh, as, you, as, you, as you know, the embedding models are uh, being created uh, uh, using this uh, approach as well. On the other hand, the metrics that, that we are using for knowledge graph and the embedding models uh, might be different here. So first of all, we are just looking at the user similarity and for religion and hate, uh, the extremist and non-extremist users are significantly similar to each other for religion, which is expected. And for hate, uh, extremist and non-extremist users are, do not show much similarity. On the other hand, uh, for religion and hate among extremists, so this is among extremists. Uh, so we find some number of users that are significantly different from uh, each other. Uh, so we are suspecting that, so these may be uh, outliers. So this is an extremist data set that we have. On the other hand, we are now suspecting that there might be some number of users that was labeled as extremists, but they are actually not extremists. So to be able to uh, identify those, so we just uh, look at the three-dimensional, uh, these users in three-dimensional, two-dimensional space, and Still, we are using some number of uh, users, a group of users. Uh, they form a cluster uh, farther from other users, uh, especially for religion and hate dimension. So, so then we are suspecting even more uh, that, that there might be some outliers in the data set. So we, just to make sure that we are seeing actually uh, outliers over there, so randomly selected 10 users and visualize for each dimension. And we repeated this selection many times. Uh, and every time only the same users uh, form a separate cluster. For example, you can see here the D and A uh, users for uh, hate dimension. And for the religion dimension, uh, you can see the same users forming uh, a cluster uh, farther from other users in the same dimension. Uh, so on the other hand, we just wanted to make sure that, so these are truly outliers, so that uh, we did some uh, statistical analysis, uh, just uh, confirming that there are some outlier users. So we just use some, uh, we, we, we just use some clustering algorithm and we identified 99 users, uh, 48 and 141 users in the extremist data set clustered as outliers. And each of them are for different dimensions, religion, ideology, and hate. So just to confirm, to validate our results, we randomly sampled 15% of, uh, of these users. And uh, we gave them to the domain expert that, are, that, is, that who, who was a, uh, our co collaborator uh, in religious extremism. And he annotated these users and uh, the Kappa score was 82%. So we obtained at the end 49 outlier users in the extremist data set. So then we rest, rest of them was labeled as uh, likely uh, extremist users. So over here, the problem was we took this data set that was actually labeled by the Twitter. Uh, so 49 users were outliers, meaning they were labeled as out, uh, extremists but we find out that they were not really uh, extremists. So, uh, so, and then we dig down a little bit more. I mean, why would that happen? So the Twitter's, uh, um, the labeling or, or the uh, reviewing these uh, accounts was, so they, they have a team and this team was actually uh, some uh, anti-abuse team. So they were not trained specifically for this domain. So they don't have any Islamic knowledge or they don't have any kind of uh, extremists uh, uh, 
Islamist extremist uh, domain knowledge per se. Uh, so they just labeled uh, these 49 users uh, as extremists, uh, even though we found them as non-extremists. So we removed these 49 outliers from the data set and then continue uh, our uh, uh, modeling uh, with the rest of the users. So in our experiments, uh, we use the tri-dimensional tri model, meaning uh, we used uh, uh, three dimensions, religion, ideology, and hate. And uh, just for experimentation, we used uh, two dimensions only, just for comparison. Uh, we use precision uh, as a metric, as a, as a metric, because we just wanted to emphasize the reduction on misclassification of non-extremist content. Because the precision is about, uh, about the misclassification of the non-extremist content, meaning when we have higher uh, mis uh, precision, we are going to uh, have lower uh, misclassification of the non-extremist users. So on the other hand, when we have higher recall, then we are going to have more misclassification of the extremist users, meaning we, are, we can actually label uh, extremist users as non-extremist users. On the other hand, in this case, if the precision is lower, then we can label uh, extremist users uh, non-extremist users as extremist users. So we don't want that. So we can rather choose, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a decision that we can make or we can debate. So this is an ethical consideration that needs to be discussed. Uh, how ethical uh, is that decision? Uh, on the other hand, uh, we chose to, uh, we chose precision over recall in, in this case, because we don't want to, uh, label innocent people as uh, non-extremist, uh, as, as extremist users, uh, uh, while uh, we are uh, uh, mislabeling uh, 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 extremist users as uh, non-extremist users. So this is a decision that we made. So because the implications of this kind of decisions are going to be uh, much lower, uh, because we are reducing the misclassification of the non-extremist uh, non-extremist non users. So at the end, uh, this tells us uh, overall, domain-specific knowledge is quite important uh, while we are modeling this kind of uh, uh, conversations or the problems that is going to have huge impacts in society. So, uh, and also the false alarms, so we are significantly reducing the false alarm and incorporation of the three uh, domain specific dimensions. So it is uh, reducing the likelihood of, of an unfair mistreatment as well, uh, as we are uh, uh, reducing the misclassification of non-extremist uh, users uh, too. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the higher precision uh, is, a, uh, is a better choice for us to reduce potential social discrimina uh, discrimination. <laughs> On the other hand, extremist users employ religion uh, along with hate, uh, suggesting that they employ different hate tech tactics uh, for their targets. Uh, and over here, each dimension, the religion, ideology, and hate, they play different roles in different levels uh, of radicalization in, from the first to the, to the, to the, uh, to the extreme level. Uh, and capturing nuances in each of these uh, stages is quite important. Uh, uh, and it is going to uh, it's going to contribute to the uh, to the fairness of the of the model in general. And in general, this is just an example uh, in the domain of cyber social threats. Uh, on the other hand, uh, our overall approach for this particular problems uh, it can be harassment or it can be uh, radicalization or it can be uh, fake news. So we try to employ uh, some approach, a highly multidisciplinary approach that was uh, inspired by the neural and cognitive processes uh, of a human and the social processes uh, in, in our society uh, so that we can, <clears throat> we can create our models 
uh, more intuitively uh, so that we can relate to, uh, relate to the outcome more in, uh, intuitively. Uh, so then the outcomes are going to be uh, uh, more clear uh, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and, and, the, and, and reliable. Uh, and it's going to be uh, much more fair uh, in general, uh, especially for this kind of uh, important problems. So uh, these are the uh, reference that you can have a look uh, later, uh, where we are uh, explaining other uh, uh, examples, uh, where we discuss uh, how we uh, inc incorporate knowledge in these particular problems and um, how we can um, uh, uh, how we are trying to uh, solve these problems uh, using external knowledge as well. Go on. Hi everyone. Yeah, I'm sharing the screen. All right. You guys have 20 minutes each uh, for you and Shweta, roughly. Or a little less. Try try to do it in few minutes. Yeah. So then we can have a few minutes before we end before six o'clock. All right. You can see my screen, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ruan Vikramarachi. Uh, today, uh, I'll be uh, in, in this part of this tutorial, uh, I'll be continuing our discussion on knowledge infused learning in the context of uh, uh, proper context understanding or the deep context understanding. Uh, so, even though uh, we are actually focusing on the uh, autonomous driving use case, uh, the pipeline and the, uh, the research process we are presenting here is quite generic to be applicable for other uh, domains. So this is an ongoing uh, collaboration with Bosch and the AI Institute. And uh, so let me just give you a, a quick overview of, uh, uh, of the problem. So if not all, I'm pretty sure uh, most of you are familiar with this uh, incident. So back in 2018, Uber's uh, self-driving car uh, uh, crashed into a pedestrian, which caused the, uh, the first fatality reported uh, by a self-driving car. So uh, to give you what happened uh, in this uh, incident was basically the Uber self-driving was a self-driving car was driving uh, in a uh, neighborhood uh, in a, in a, uh, in in Arizona. It, yeah. So uh, at night, then uh, the pedestrian was actually crossing the uh, road, uh, but not using a, a crosswalk. Uh, what happened was Uber's AI first detected uh, the pedestrian as, uh, as an unknown object. Then um, it few seconds later detected as a bicycle. But the AI could not actually uh, determine this is a complex event, complicated event, uh, which involves a human or the pedestrian with the bicycle uh, crossing the road, uh, not on a crosswalk. So this poses a question uh, whether the uh, AI in the current self-driving technology has the proper context understanding. Because we humans, on the other hand, uh, even though we might have not seen a jaywalking, uh, jaywalking pedestrian on the road, we know from a lifelong experience that uh, we should slow down or uh, break. Uh, with that uh, uh, kind of like motivation, so the question we are trying to answer here is, can the knowledge of automotive scenes improve the machine understanding? Uh, so, the overall process uh, uh, we have followed here, the first thing was to, uh, you need to have a knowledge graph of scenes. Uh, since we couldn't find any knowledge graph with uh, uh, rich uh, sources of you know, scene information, 
the first thing we had to do was to uh, build up our knowledge graph. Then, um, since most of the AI and almost all the uh, self-driving AI uh, is relying on uh, deep learning algorithms, so they usually expect um, uh, these external knowledge uh, to be in a vector format or uh, some, some intermediate format the uh, deep learning algorithms can understand. So uh, what we have uh, chosen to do here was to have used the knowledge graph and convert it to a latent representation, which we call as uh, knowledge graph embeddings here. So um, the third step, uh, we are taking a uh, kind of a different route here. So uh, the practice have been um, when uh, practice has been when you have a knowledge graph embedding, you use it with, directly with the application. But uh, since our problem domain is uh, really critical and we don't want to have uh, you know noise added to the AI algorithm, so we wanted to make sure that uh, the information we are giving, or the latent embedding space we are learning from the knowledge graph. Uh, has the rich semantics originally contained in the knowledge graph. So we'll be doing a intrinsic evaluation of the embeddings and see whether our embedding space has all these uh, rich semantics. So finally, uh, we'll be using it, uh, using the learned embedding space on a real world uh, autonomous driving use case. Uh, the first step, we uh, looked at uh, the data sets uh, of the autonomous driving. Um, so before, uh, I mean, because uh, I'll be using this terminology throughout the presentation, uh, throughout the talk. So let me first, uh, first introduce uh, what, what I mean by a scene and a sub scene is. So in these data sets, usually a scene is considered as a, a 20 second or 50 second drive. And a sub scene is, a, is particularly a snapshot of uh, that uh, taken during that drive. And these, snapshot is, uh, these snapshots are actually annotated. So uh, we looked at two data sets, the new scenes from Active and the Lyft uh, level five data set. So a uh, little bit about the, some uh, data set statistics, a new scene has uh, roughly a uh, thousand scenes, meaning thousand drives with uh, 40K uh, sub scenes. So these data sets uh, usually have, you know, multimodal data, uh, for example, camera images, uh, LIDAR sweeps, uh, radar sweeps and the object bounding boxes. Uh, they also have uh, the annotations provided for the, the objects and events uh, captured. So we use these annotations uh, to build a knowledge graph. Um, so as we know that knowledge graph has like you know, two components, you have the ontology. Uh, first, what we did was to extend the Bosch scene ontology to include all the, uh, subsume all the features of interest and events uh, present in bo both the data sets, uh, meaning new scenes and lift. Uh, lift. So we, once we have generated uh, the uh, data set, uh, knowledge graph, uh, we have roughly around uh, 34,000 uh, scenes and 5.95 million uh, triples. So one thing to uh, note here is uh, since each, each and every uh, feature of interest and event is uniquely identified in, in these data sets, uh, we have you know higher number of entities unique entities so in the case of uh, new scenes we have 2.1 million so lift on the uh, other hand is a bit smaller uh, so it, it has like uh, 1.3 uh, uh, million so our knowledge graph is not very deep uh, so we have only 11 uh, relations uh, then what we looked at was uh, uh, the algorithms. So how can we use the knowledge graph we build and translate it to embeddings? So from the literature, uh, when we looked at the literature, we identified there are you know, different classes of knowledge graph uh, embedding algorithms. So we uh, picked uh, three. Uh, so one, uh, trans uh, three popular algorithms. So trans for example, is from the class of uh, transitional distance-based ones. And then the rescal is from uh, tensor uh, factorization-based uh, ones. And wholly is uh, uh, extension of Rescal, which uses a, comp a compositional operator. Uh, the, the other thing is, since I have mentioned that we have higher number of entities, it's really important to uh, pick an algorithm that is scalable to a large uh, knowledge graph. Um, then, okay, then uh, uh, the practice have uh, the practice uh, of the using knowledge graphs and downstream ap application application source. Basically, people use uh, people generate uh, the knowledge graph embeddings and use it with uh, you know link prediction, knowledge graph completion, or any other uh, downstream task. 
But here we wanted to uh, look at intrinsic evaluation. So we looked at literature and there's not much of work in this uh, area. So we found a, a recent paper published in 2019, uh, which looked at uh, uh, some metrics. So they're trying to uh, use uh, uh, some metrics to quantify the quality uh, of uh, uh, different types of semantics we have in the knowledge graph. For example, uh, the type semantics actually uh, captured through the categorization measure and the coherence measure and the semantic uh, transitional distance captures the uh, relational semantics that exists between the, uh, the instances. Um, so now we, uh, I have mentioned that we have a couple of uh, metrics to quantify the quality. Uh, then uh, one thing we noticed, noticed in the literature was uh, when a knowledge graph is actually uh, given to an algorithm, so people usually use the knowledge graph in uh, the tri triple format, uh, so the basic knowledge graph without any inference. But on the other hand, if you take a step back, uh, in semantic applications, we know uh, people uh, use reasoners. So the implicit relations uh, we have in the knowledge graph uh, can, be, can be inferred through reasoners. Uh, so they can be uh, beneficial in the downstream applications. So uh, we wanted to, um, uh, create an experiment so to see if we have uh, all these, the inference capabilities uh, given uh, as a pre-processing step, uh, can the learning algorithm uh, be benefited by the, uh, the rich semantics we give uh, here? So the first thing we did was to, uh, so we have the base knowledge graph. In the second, uh, second box I have, here's the, uh, uh, knowledge graph with type information. So what we, uh, what we are doing here is, for example, in this case, um, let's say we have a instance B, which is of type as a capital C in the ontology. But we know that uh, a C, uh, A is the parent of C. So that means there's an implicit path, uh, implicit uh, type relation that exists between the instance B and the class A. So in this version of the knowledge graph, we made these uh, implicit uh, uh, information explicit. So, so in the triple store, we have this information now. Uh, in the third type, what we have done was, uh, this is the uh, knowledge graph with highest level of information. So basically we, uh, we know that there exist, uh, you know, uh, there exist path in the instances. For example, uh, if you go from B instance B to D to E, uh, there's an implicit path from B to E. So we refined all these paths in addition to the, uh, in addition to having the type semantics uh, uh, explicit. So uh, creating a, a knowledge graph with the highest uh, levels of information detail. Okay, now uh, we looked at, you know, three uh, metrics to quantify the quality and we have three types of knowledge, graph, uh, knowledge graphs with uh, various levels of uh, information. Then uh, we looked at uh, how well these are actually uh, represented in the, uh, uh, in the embedding space. So we created Disney projections like in you know, the 2D projections. So you can see that when going from um, the base knowledge graph to the knowledge graph with ray five paths. So in the base knowledge graph, sorry, in the base knowledge graph, you basically have some small clusters uh, which corresponds to the type. But when you go to the, uh, the, the plot with, uh, uh, with knowledge graph with ray five paths, you can see that there's a, you know, 10 plus, there are 10 clusters. So uh, one thing to note here is in this embedding space, we have only 10 scenes. So the 10 clusters you see here are actually are from the 10 scenes. Uh, so what's, what's happening here is you see a natural clustering of scenes and inside those clusters, you see a small, uh, you know, clusters that are uh, from different classes of uh, features of interest or events. So uh, when we look at the objects and events, we can see uh, they are categorized based on the type as well as the scenes. A uh, scene, uh, you know, is part of relations. Uh, then what we looked at was uh, how well the scene and all of the uh, all of the sub scenes actually are represented in the embedding space. You can see in the base knowledge graph when we generate embeddings from the base knowledge graph. So basically, all the sub scenes are scattered around, uh, and the super scenes are 
in one one place so but if you go to the knowledge graph with the rayfide pass on your right you can see uh, if you take this cluster this has all the sub scenes in small dots and the super scene in the middle with the bigger with the large dot so that means the embedding space is actually learning about uh, the a scene sub scene relationship which is really important uh, in the in in this uh, in scene understanding yeah so moving on to the evaluation results um, we can uh, i'm not going into detail uh, about like each and every plot but if i if i'm uh, giving the summary here you can see uh, the both all the categorization measure the coherence measure and the transitional uh, semantic transitional distance uh, when you have the knowledge graph with the rayfide path or in other words uh, the highest uh, knowledge graph with highest information detail uh, all these matrix are actually uh, superior compared to the other less uh, uh, informative variants uh, when it comes to uh, the algorithm perspective uh, we have seen uh, trans is scalable and uh, performs better compared to rescal and holly um talking about the metrics so uh we noted that we have noticed that the coherence measure might not be a good idea uh, to evaluate the embeddings in this domain because so what the coherence measure does is basically see um, how pure the cluster uh, is so if you have a uh, if you have a uh, instance of a human and it tries to see um, like you know in in the distance of n elements how many of them are from a type uh, by the the human but in our case um, so the embedding space is actually dominant by the scene sub scene relation and the uh, and the features of interest and events so we can't expect to have higher coherence measure in this in this use case um, when it comes to new scenes what we have seen was uh, uh, i mentioned earlier that uh, our our data set uh, new scene is the bigger data set so the info the knowledge graph with the highest information detail has uh, 10.8 million triples with the 2.1 million entities so rescal did not scale to this data set but uh, so we have evaluated only on a transi and holy um, when it comes to informational detail it's uh, conformant with the lift results uh, we can see that high, knowledge graph with highest informational detail yields uh, better uh you know categorization the or the type semantics and the relational semantics um even the algorithmic perspe perspective is the uh, same with the lift uh, transi performs better uh here in this case uh, with lift uh, me coherence measure is slightly improving but uh, the its use uh, its usefulness in this domain is um, questionable um then what we did was now we have looked at uh, how well the embeddings actually uh embedding are actually capturing the rich semantics contained in the knowledge graph so we wanted to use it with the uh, real world application so we picked scene similarity so uh, what happens with scene similarity is if you are given a scene um we want to have uh, all this we want to have uh, the model to find all the scenes that are similar to uh, that are contextually similar to the given scene so since we have a, a knowledge graph uh, you might suggest that uh, maybe we can use a topology based uh, similarity measure or if the if the textual if if the uh, data set uh, has uh, textual descriptions of each scene someone can just uh, generate a, a word embedding model and then uh, do the similarity calculation but unfortunately uh, both of these uh, methods won't work with our problem setting because uh, one thing is uh, our knowledge graph is uh, our hierarchy in the ontology is not too deep so that's why uh, we can't use uh, the similarity based uh, uh, sort topology based uh, similarity measures and about the textual descriptions uh, uh, if it, if i take new scenes for example it has uh, descriptions but they are just five six words long so that is not enough to generate the word embedding model so what we did was since now we have you know rich knowledge graph embedding space we use the embedding space to uh, compute scene similarity so first uh, use case uh, we have chosen was um, try to find uh, sub scenes from the same super scene basically we wanted to make sure 
the embedding model we trained can capture the same spatiotemporal context. So uh, in, in this case, we, we can see uh, this image is the given image, uh, given uh, subsea. So uh, the model can find the subsea, which is from the same tribe. So that meaning it can capture uh, the same spatiotemporal uh, context. Then the next, uh, we wanted to uh, make the uh, task a little bit difficult. So here, uh, what we're trying to ask the model is, so if you are given an image, uh, if you are given a, a subscene, can you find a subscene from a different uh, spatiotemporal context? Uh, so imagine that uh, uh, you have come across uh, uh, some, some training data from uh, a drive in California. But uh, now the autonomous car is actually driving in Texas. Uh, but the scene, the, the current scene of the autonomous car is might be contextually similar to the one uh, one of uh, the scenes the car might have actually trained on in California. So we want to make sure that the model can capture uh, these similarities. And even though the, 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 the scenes are visually dissimilar, the model should be able to capture the contextual similarity. So we can see here the black string of objects are actually barriers. And here the uh, the orange boxes are the string of uh, the boxes are actually uh, parked cars, and here also the vehicle is trying to take uh, a left. In this case, also the vehicle is trying to take a left. A left. So even though these two two subscenes are visually dissimilar, they both are contextually uh, similar. So the model could capture that. Um, so as key to takeaways. Um, our evaluation with you know looking at uh, multiple uh, evaluation metrics and uh, the 2d uh, visualization of the embedding space so support that uh, the hypothesis that the kg with highest uh, informational detail uh, yields better quality embeddings with respect to both the type semantics and the relational semantics that are contained in the, the knowledge graph um, and about the algorithms um, we want to note that the transit performed better uh, in terms of both the scalability and the embedding quality. And uh, so I, I already mentioned that this is an emerging field and there's not much work on uh, quantifying the quality of the embeddings uh, when it comes to knowledge graph embeddings. So uh, we have noticed that uh, the evaluation metrics proposed by uh, Alshraki are, are better suited to evaluating embeddings generated from uh, transitional distance-based methods because uh, so what they have done was to actually adapt uh, some uh, of the metrics from the word embedding literature and from the uh, uh, from algorithms which use uh, transitional distance-based uh, loss functions. So that's why uh, these metrics are better suited for uh, these kind of algorithms. Uh, yeah, with that, uh, uh, I conclude the my part of the tutorial. And here we have listed all the references, including the paper to this work and, uh, you know, and all the data sets and uh, some uh, book chapters and papers on neurosymbolic context understanding. Thank you. Shweta? Yeah, so maybe you can stop sharing and I will share. All right. Yeah, so my, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, good day, everyone. My name is Shweta Yadav, and I'm postdoctoral research fellow at uh, Wright State University, and I'm currently moving to AI Institute. So in this part of the talk, we will see how our knowledge infusion in uh, natural language processing can assist in identifying cyber account on dark web. So I will try to keep this presentation as short, simple, and interesting as possible. So uh, let's take an overview of uh, what exactly the problem is. So over the last few years, the darknet market has been playing a substantial role in uh, distribution of illicit uh, substances or good. So uh, to combat this drug trafficking, also known as uh, uh, drug trading in the cyberspace, so we 
requires an urgent need for automatic analysis of participant in the darknet market. So however, one key challenge is the drug trafficker or vendor may maintain a multiple account, uh, like as you can see on the screen. So like the vendors have the multiple account on the dark web where they are selling the illicit group and each of their site can be treated in, uh, in our problem in a linguistic way uh, as a text. So, but the key challenge here is that uh, since this drug trafficker maintain a multiple uh, account across a different market or within the same market, uh, like Silk Road or Wall Street, to name a few. So the idea, the overall idea is to leverage the information from the vendor textual content, like a product description available on their website using natural language processing technique and simultaneously enrich uh, the NLP algorithm with domain specific knowledge like drug abuse ontology, as you can see. So uh, drug abuse ontology is, uh, is a domain specific contextual uh, framework for interconnecting sets of clauses, uh, which are very much related to uh, drug focused lexicon. So one of the key benefit of using an ontology uh, enhanced semantic approach is the ability to identify all the variant of concept in the data. So uh, let's suppose over here uh, from the site one and site uh, two and three, we identify that they are talking about the morphine, heroin, or cadine. Uh, so if we try to have, a, uh, if we have a, some of the external knowledge, which says that a morphine and cadine are the trade name and they are somehow related to each other, that can help us to identify that whether uh, whether that particular vendor are related or not related to each other, because uh, because it has been seen that a vendor try to sell the products in which uh, they are uh, uh, very much uh, known with, so that people know that to whom to contact the vendor. So. Moving ahead, so the, uh, the research question uh, which we are seeking to answer is that uh, does semantically enriching the natural language processing algorithm with domain specific knowledge increase the uh, coverage in text understanding? So uh, what makes the darknet market or dark web so popular among the drug, uh, drug vendor? So a uh, darknet market as it is hidden a uh, part of the internet. So in as it employs advanced encryption technique to protect the anonymity of this user. So the market is hosted uh, in a darknet and built upon the Tor services to hide the IP address, uh, the escrow system, uh, or the encrypted communication, like with the use of like PGP, which is known as a pretty good uh, privacy and virtually untraceable uh, cryptocurrency, for example, Bitcoin. Uh, so it facilitate the anonymous transaction among the participant. And due to this anonymity, there has been a dramatic growth of uh, uh, underground dark, drug market hosted in the dark net. So uh, this is this slide illustrates uh, how a typical transaction occur in a crypto market. So well, as you can see, uh, in it is a st eight stage process that occur between buyer and vendor. Uh, the first step, uh, first step start off with a vendor when they advertise a product in the market. So just like any other market, buyer places an order with the market. However, the important thing here is to note that a transaction made in the market is within the cryptocurrency like a Bitcoin, Litecoin. So what makes them so popular among the market is uh, firstly the anonymity and uh, secondly, very secure and encrypted transaction, which enable, uh, which is enabled by the blockchain technology. So uh, let us talk about the importance of the problem first. Uh, Darknet market has, as you, as I've discussed earlier, has grown substantially uh, over the last few years. So this particular data is from the period of 2013 to 2016, and the total revenue has doubled during this period. Uh, the total number of transaction has tripled and so on. So even though uh, government and other agencies are working hard in shutting down uh, these market, more markets uh, are keep emerging and the revenue of this market shows uh, no sign of slowing down either. 
So uh, to combat the drug trafficking, uh, we hold the motivation that there is an urgent need for the analysis of participant in the darknet market as it could provide a valuable insight to the uh, investigation of drug trafficking ecosystem and uh, prediction of the future uh, incident while building uh, proactive defenses. However, one of the key challenge is, as I said, that they maintain a multiple account across a different market. And therefore, it is necessary to link these different accounts to accurately evaluate the volume of the substances advertised across a different darknet market. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it is an extremely labor intensive to manually explore and link the various account owing to the increasing number of darknet market, hence developing uh, novel technique that can automatically connect various account of the same vendor on darknet market uh, is uh, extremely desirable. So uh, let's uh, look at the snapshot of the darknet market and the information available. So uh, we have a lot of information from this snap alone uh, to avoid boring you. Uh, let me only direct your attention to a few of them. So first would be the categories. So we extracted for fentanyl, fentanyl analogs, and other non-pharmaceutical synthetic opioids only. Uh, the second would be the vendor name. Uh, and the, so the vendor name act as a brand in these market as anonymity uh, is of paramount importance. And then we have a shipping information. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, then we have the shipping information. So th this mentioned that the, uh, the ship from and ship to data. So the origin country give us the more information um, about the vendor that then the ships to the field. So the, so the ship field simply mentions the country, the vendor could deliver their uh, substance or drug. So lastly is the textual data, which you can see is the description. So it contains the product description, the rating data, like how well they are performing in the market and their terms and condition. So uh, different sites offer uh, uh, some of these fields and the other fields such as images, price, etc., are also available in this market and have been uh, used as a feature in our model. So uh, now let me formally define our problem. So our problem is a vendor may have a multiple account in a different site. And our goal is to detect whether two account on the darknet market uh, belong to the same vendor. So to do so, uh, we compute the similarity between the two vendor or specifically their vendor embedding and use a threshold uh, to decide whether they are similar or not. So now uh, let us discuss about the data set. Uh, so this is the data set statistic. Here you can see that uh, we have collected uh, almost 2,000 unique vendor across three uh, different market, namely Dream Market, Toshka, and Wall Street. Uh, we only extract post about fentanyl, fentanyl analogs, and non-pharmaceutical uh, synthetic opioid, as we mentioned earlier. So. As you can see, uh, the uh, dream market holds the highest number of information, including vendor uh, name, uh, the substance, the location, and the description. So um, also, as our data statistics shows, that uh, information of a drug or substance is also widely available in the text. Now, uh, we discussed the overview of our methodology. So firstly, we extracted data from the different market, and this is done by uh, using the eDark Trends platform. Uh, it is the in-house uh, our method to do it. And then we uh, introduced the uh, drug abuse ontology to our data set to extract slang class or of the drug dosage, et cetera. We then send this data to our eDark find model so this model produces uh, the vendor embedding. These vendor embedding can be compared with each other to compute the similarity score. Uh, we then choose uh, an appropriate threshold that determines whether two vendors are similar or not. So uh, we experimented with a different threshold and noted that uh, 0.5 was the sweet spot. 
so uh, before we discuss uh, further about the model so let me uh, define multi view learning as our knowledge infused nlp method utilize the use of multi view learning to fuse various modalities so uh, multi view learning is an ideal learning uh, mechanism for data uh, from the real application where examples are characterized by distinct often orthogonal view so these multi view describe the distinct diverse and complementary uh, information of the data so in our case we capture different view of vendor by exploiting their textual contents which are mostly available in their description such as uh, stylometric features by which we can understand their writing style so for uh, example in the figure right um, vendor uses their if you could see uh, uh, at the end the example writing style you could see that a vendor could use their personal vocabulary to describe a product or use a special separator or emoticons uh, that could digitally uh, fingerprint them other important way of capturing their identity could be through the uh, through analyzing their product images example the way uh a way to display the products uh, and camera model so if you see the figure to the right uh, style 2 the background if you see uh, in a style 2 is almost identical it is it have the same strips and uh, same color which uh which shows that these two vendors are similar so uh in this way if uh, we could uh try to capture their stylometric uh, uh, views as well as uh, uh, in a photographic uh, styles we should be able to understand which two vendors are related to each other or not uh, but however in this uh, study we have limited ourselves to only exploring the textual characteristics of the vendor so thus it is more convenient for us to combine all the different views of the vendor into a single embedding so moving forward uh, this is uh, our edarc fine model which which i will discuss so we we have created a five views and let me uh, begin up with uh, uh, every each and every view step by step so our first view is a task agnostic view and for that as we know the vendor write some text and by text i mean their product description their rating uh, or their terms and condition are all included in the text so uh, for creating the first view Uh, which is a task agnostic view uh, we employed a bert language model to generate the representation of the sentence uh, which are appearing uh, on the site associated with the uh, vendor so the main reason of employing the bert is because they are uh, highly efficient in generating uh, the task agnostic input representation and uh, it also enables the low resource tasks to be benefit from this bidirectional architecture and unsupervised training framework so uh, the sentence representation is uh, usually obtained by aggregating the last few layer of the bert model and the number of the layer you want to aggregate can vary from problem to problem we notice that in our case uh, last four layer uh, produce the best representation of the sentences so in the another view uh, which is uh, the view 2 uh, uh, for that we uh, we utilize the paragraph vector and that is uh, that generate a domain specific uh, view so the reason behind utilizing the domain specific view and having that view is that since uh, pre trained language representation is uh, or the bert is uh, basically trained on the generic corpus and it is uh, and it is dense and it is not ideal for modeling the sentences in a drug domain so uh, to capture the domain specific contextual information and to capture the multilingual data we employ the uh, uh, domain specific uh, view our a third view as 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 we can see here uh, focuses on capturing the writing style of the vendor which are generally characterized by use of their personal uh, vocabulary 
or the usage of the stop word so although the content and the context may vary between the uh, document their style of usage of the stop word and special character are roughly similar so uh, to do so uh, we extracted only the stop word from the listing of the vendor and used the paragraph vector again to model the style attribute so Beside the above uh, extracted views, vendor basic information and drug they sell also play an important role in resolving their identity. So for each drug, we further extracted is substance category and the shipping information. So our uh, so the shipping information is uh, like how from where the uh, drug is being shipped to and uh, where it is shipping from or the escrow information these all are uh, captured by the view for that is a location view the for the uh, substance uh, category so our model is uh, further tailored to take an advantage of domain specific knowledge which act as a knowledge infusion module to our uh, to provide the information of the substance and this allow our model to not only capture uh, the local context uh, through the statistical method but also provide the global context uh, word knowledge about the drug so uh, moving forward so now let's uh, dig deeper into a drug abuse ontology through which we extract the class of the drug the, the vendor cell and create the embedding from the same so as you can see the drug abuse uh, ontology is very precise representation of concept and relationship uh, uh, for prescription drug abuse and it is created by the domain expert from uh, Center for Intervention Treatment uh, Addiction Research. Uh, so currently it holds uh, 241 classes and 37 properties and uh, what make it uh, distinct from the other ontologies is that uh, beside having the generic name or the scientific name they also hold the slang terms for uh, a particular concept so uh, here are some of the examples like you know Dow can uh, contain the name of psychoactive substances like heroin fentanyl uh, including synthetic substances like uh, u47700 or their brand or generic name and also the slang term like uh, Roxy Fent so uh, usage of a slang is very popular among the drug dealer or vendor. So our ontology specific uh, to the drug abuse can capture the variation as it holds the slang term for particular substance. Like for example, here lupramide has the following drug name and, uh, and that is there in our drug abuse ontology. So inclusion of uh, the domain knowledge makes our approach more robust in capturing the variability of the text, which was not explored well at all uh, in the literature. So uh, moving forward, our uh, DAO ontology also have information regarding route of administration, the dosage, uh, the psychological effect, and uh, the substance form. And it is con continuously being enriched with the external ontologies, uh, as is mentioned, like the drug bay and fee base, DBpedia, psych ontologies, et cetera. And uh, here, if it is visible, you can see uh, that uh, substance method has a various instances like a Tussol, Mydon, and so forth. And we could encode this variation uh, by using the drug abuse ontology. So this snippet uh, is from our uh, data set, which shows the location and the substance information is widely used in the description of the product uh, when the vendor are selling. Uh, so for each drug, uh, we extract a substance and shipping information, example from where uh, and to where. Uh, so the location from which a vendor operate is an important feature in our vendor embedding. However, uh, uh, the location information can be expressed in various formats. For example, uh, United States of America can be expressed as USA, or uh, as you can see here, Norway can be expressed as Norway, or even uh, uh, the vendor could have their own slang terms uh, for uh, identifying particular uh, location. Uh, 
So now let us discuss in detail about how the drug abuse the ontology is utilized to capture the substance view. So the substance or the class of drug the vendor sell uh, is generally very important uh, feature of the vendors. And for that, uh, we uh, we had uh, 362 unique substances of the in our data set. And to further uh, reduce the number of dimension, we group them by a class of the drug. And this method allow us to create a very small uh, feature, specifically 16 classes, as you can show, as it can be seen in the figure. Uh, so our uh, embedding is uh, as simple as binary embedding where the value of the vendor satisfies a feature and zero otherwise. So in, in this case, the feature we are talking about is does the vendor operate from country A or not, or that the substance belong to any of the 16 uh, categories. So however, uh, this uh, uh, assumes that each column is of equal importance, which is not valid. So therefore, we provided a self-information weight or the information content for all the features that help the modeling that uh, which has much more probability uh, from uh, uh, for the location or for the substance. So uh, in order to fuse the different views, we employ uh, the weighted generalized CCA that, uh, that, uh, that fuse different embedding by making use of their covariance matrix. Uh, so basically, co canonical correlation analysis is usually used when the multiple modality should be fused. Uh, since our main goal uh, of the CCA is to find uh, is to find a set of transform variable uh, that can have a maximum correlation over the data set. So, so we utilize a generalized CCA and learn a common sub uh, common subspace across a multiple view. So uh, here you can see uh, the results, and these are the results of our model on different data sets. So uh, using the above data sets, uh, uh, which I said we have a three different data set, uh, but we form another three annotated data set that, uh, like uh, Dream Toshka, Dream uh, Board. I want to skip some details, uh, wrap up. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, so as you can see here that we have uh, three different uh, data set and uh, by our model, we achieve the highest accuracy and the same similarly, you can see for the substance and the location information, if we try to uh, infuse the knowledge, it is, uh, it is uh, also improving the performance of the model. Uh, th and uh, similarly, this can be uh, seen when we have the all of the sites uh, are combined. So, uh, so there are some of the crucial points uh, which are brought forward by our domain expert, like uh, there is a multilingual and code mixed text that, uh, that the vendor use. Uh, there's a slang term across the listing. There's a lack of uniform feature in the website or, uh, uh, or uh, only uh, the favorable postings are uh, branded in these market. And uh, these are some of uh, the use cases from our data set. And uh, as you can see, I won't go to the other three, but if you can see the first one, uh, the, you can see that most like uh, most of the text are similar, which uh, which says that uh, we, we are confident that uh, that it is the same vendor since the username were the same. So the uh, the highlight the highlighted portion here represent the uh, similarity between these two texts. And if you can notice that even uh, the timestamp is similar. So this is the case of branding using a software or bots. And the other things you can see are the same uh, styles which have been used by the different vendors. So uh, let me conclude the presentation. Just go to the next one. Uh, let me just help me prepare uh, the last slide. Uh, no, no, let's, let's, let's wrap it up. Uh, we need to wrap up now. Okay. 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 And yeah, don't sign off. Uh, just uh, you'll help me. Just advance the slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next one. All right. So I'll uh, kind of end up. Uh, just go one slide back. I'll uh, you know uh, wrap up. Um, um, the you know the the at, at the AI Institute we are you know our projects have pervasive use of uh, knowledge graph in uh, our learning techniques. Uh, there are on the left hand side, you can just see some of the examples of the projects going on. 
and uh, we are a highly interdisciplinary uh, uh, group. Um, so we have projects with uh, practically all colleges in the institute, sorry, in, on the campus. Uh, next slide. So with this then, uh, um, let us uh, open up for any quick quest questions you have. Uh, we'll of course remain uh, re uh, available for questions by email also. But um, if you have any questions, uh, please let us know. We don't really have time for questions because we're over, but the Discord is available for everyone to go over there and do Q&A there. Okay. All right. Thanks for coming, everybody. And hopefully you will join us also tomorrow for our events tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.